been my privilege to be uh, chairman of the Oklahoma Peanut Commission for the last, uh, I don't know, few years. Um, uh, the, uh, we're, we are, are very privileged to, to be able to put on the, the expo each year. Last year, uh, uh, we were, as Ron said, we were, we were the last probably face-to-face -face peanut meeting maybe in the world. Uh, certainly in the United States, and then we went virtual. Hopefully, uh, this will maybe be the last virtual meeting, and uh, our economy and our meetings will resume to a more normal level. But uh, uh, great to have everyone here today. I think we've got an outstanding program. I'm really excited to look at the lineup of speakers and topics that uh, uh, Ron uh, uh, Scholler has been able to put together for us because we got a it's a pretty amazing program, I think. But uh, Ron, I'm going to give it back to you now. Thank you, Les. Uh, we certainly have, a, we do have an outstanding program. We've assembled a, a great group of speakers, but it, we've had a great team working on this effort and we're gonna continue that today and into the future. I do want to start with a very brief preamble before we get into the heavy lifting, the, the real uh, meat and potatoes of our program and uh, make a few comments about what I call looking outward, looking looking outward, looking inward, which intuitively seems a bit backwards, but I hope my logic will make sense as we proceed. Um, we have a lot of challenges in our industry, not just in Oklahoma, but our, our, our national and international industry. But there's also great good news. As you'll hear today with a lot more detail with other speakers, peanut consumption is up. That's great news. And why wouldn't it be up? Um, this, uh, the increase is certainly not all motivated by the pandemic, but that's part of it. Uh, peanuts are a, a natural selection for the conditions we've, uh, we've gone through. It's comfortable, it's uh, economic, it, it's just the right uh, thing that the doctor ordered. With so much emphasis on healthy eating these days, peanuts are a natural choice. Um, the well-known healthy qualities, the attributes are, are documented. They're, they're being more broadly accepted, embraced by the consuming public. That's great news. And then uh, what I call peanut opportunities. As healthy nutrition is emphasized, and we're certainly going to see that out of the government in the days ahead, a lot of, a lot of discussion about nutrition programs and what uh, what this is going to mean for various industries, but it's great news for the peanut industry. Uh, peanuts are going to be at the table, pun intended. And then uh, what I call looking outward, the Oklahoma peanut industry is looking up. Uh, we've got a lot of great things going on. We're, we're not where we used to be, but we're not where we're going to be, is the way I like to phrase it. And if you take a look, one of the places to start is how our, our yields have been here in the state of Oklahoma. Two of the uh, highest yielding crops we've had in the history of peanut production in Oklahoma have occurred in two of the last four years, more than two ton per acre. That would have just, that was unheard of just a very short few years ago. The downward trend on acres is of course troubling. We have stabilized. And we will see some increase this year uh, with more contracts available and improved prices. Uh, we're, we're optimistic that we're going to get um, substantially more acres planted. Uh, these three bars on this chart are rather un uh, arbitrarily chosen, but just looking at the three decades uh, since 1991, Statewide average yields have gone from just over 2,200 pounds per acre, well, almost 2,300 pounds per acre to uh, 3,560 pounds per acre. That, that is a dramatic and important uh, change, no, which is no stranger. This is not new information to those on this call, but something we can collectively be very proud of. Uh, some of this is a blinding flash of the obvious, uh, but where have we, what has been responsible for these improvements? Well, first of all, the great research coming out of our, not just our organization, our state institutions here in Oklahoma and USDA, but, but all of the peanut states that we're able to uh, glom onto their 
uh, results and use here, but we have good researchers, great researchers working here in Oklahoma and, and coming up with solutions for our multiple problems. Superior varieties, who would have ever thought that we, we, we would be talking about yields of six, seven, even 8,000 pounds per acre in research plots, but growers are making six and 7,000 pounds per acre. That would have been, that was unheard of not that long ago. Our growers continue to be committed to peanuts. You don't have any half-hearted peanut growers anymore. Maybe uh, generously, maybe we never did, but uh, certainly those who remain uh, in the business these days, this is serious business and uh, uh, they take it just that way. And then the great partnerships that exist all across, not just our Oklahoma industry, but the peanut industry as a whole. And much more will be said about that as we go forward. These are the organizations that have ownership for what's happening today. The Oklahoma Peanut Commission, partnering with the uh, OSU Division of Agriculture, uh, Josh Bichon specifically, uh, who works uh, great with us and the researchers and, and, and in the departments. And then uh, USDA ARS, our Stillwater Research Location, our partners there, and then of course always the National Peanut Board who funds much of our work and, and leads the charge nationally and even internationally uh, to improve the lot of the entire peanut industry. We so greatly value our partnership with all of these organizations. No, there are no rookies here and uh, they know their business. And when we, the synergy that comes out of working together is just uh, enormous. Then we'll say thanks to all who support and make the Oklahoma peanut industry uh, possible. The seed producers and sellers, equipment fertilizer and chemical dealers, the lenders, the crop advisors, the buying points, and a host of others. And I wanna to mention two sponsors specifically that play fundamental and rudimentary roles in our industry here in Oklahoma. And that would be Birdsong Peanuts who buy our growers peanuts and send them through the marketing chain and then Oklahoma Genetics Incorporated, who make it possible to put the, the great varieties that are generated through our research programs into the hands of growers. Can't say enough about all of these partnerships. They're, they're again, I'm being redundant, but they're so fundamental uh, to our success. This is our program for today. All of you, I know, have seen it because we sent it out to you multiple times. Uh, Again, I repeat myself, but I believe it's a very strong program and I think all will benefit and gain insights from it. I do want to mention that the program today is being recorded. Uh, you will be able to share this, uh, come back and look at view it later if you choose or share that information with others and uh, so that they can take advantage of, of what has been put together. Uh, moving into the meat of our program now, I want to introduce Dr. Marshall Lamb, who is the research leader and location coordinator for USDA ARS at the National Peanut Research Lab in Dawson, Georgia. Uh, Marshall's project there is entitled Enhancing the Competitiveness of US Peanuts and Peanut-Based Cropping Systems. He has widely or public he has published extensively. He's a widely sought, out, sought after as a speaker. He's been on this very program several years in a row. Uh, one of the most notable things he's done for Peanuts is to, de to develop expert systems for farm management and marketing risk management. And specifically, he is a co-developer on the expert system for peanut irrigation called Irrigator Pro. Marshall got his, received his BS and MS degrees from the University of Georgia and a PhD from Auburn. University. Marshall, we're anxious to hear from you about uh, the outlook for the 2021, 2021 peanut crop. Okay. Uh, you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Scholler, and thank you, uh, Dr. Kral, for inviting me to join this meeting today. Um, I agree with what you said, Ron. It'd be a lot better in person, and as Dr. Kral said, we're going to be in person soon, and I look forward to when we can actually do that. Um, Josh, have we, am I sharing with everybody now? No, Dr. Schuller needs to stop sharing first. Okay, gotcha. Okay. I'll figure out how to do this. Here we go. Got it. All right, Marshall, you should be able to share now. Uh, 
Share screen at the bottom. Share, got you. And I think that's the one we chose. And then I'll go full screen. That should, is that got it, Josh? You need to go back up to the top left to the display settings and swap. Okay, that got it? Great. Okay, thank you, uh, Josh. Um, like I said, I appreciate the invitation and I'm glad to be here with everybody today. It is certainly a different uh, peanut market that we're in compared to previous years. And the same goes for corn and cotton and soybeans. Um, I've, I've been out to y'all and other meetings around the country for the past several years when crop prices were low and it was a depressed moment. And now that everything is good, I, I'm not traveling anymore. So we can't kind of rejoice together. So, but we're gonna get through it. Just wanna run through today on the 21 peanut markets. And if we take a look at a little bit of history on acreage and all, this is the harvested acres and a uh, million acres in the United States. And as you can see, since 2010, it's been an up and down uh, situation in certain years. And it's because we went to a more market oriented um, program. In 2000, and, hold on, okay. And in 2012, 2017, and even to a degree 2020 are our peak years over this 10 year period with 12 at 1.6 million acres, uh, 2017 at almost 1.8. And then again, um, with 2020 being at 1.6. And you can see the years in between. And those are just market correction years. When we overproduce, we'll see that in a second. In 12, 17, and 17, we just re reduced everything down to get the market back in balance. And when we take a look at yields, this is an interesting slide because in 2012 and 2017, when we had our highest acreage, those were also the two years in which we had the highest production we've had in the United States, uh, yield-wise. Um, and it's just a coincidence that they uh, looked at it. But what another interesting thing is, look at how yields decreased after we've had the peak in acreage over about a three to four year period from 13 down to 16. And then when we peaked in uh, 17, with acreage, the yields decreased again. And I bet our agronomists and pathologists would say it could be a rotation factor in there that we had to work that out. But as you can see, we came in in 2020 with a, a national average yield of roughly 3,800 pounds. And those coupled together gives us total production uh, in million farmer stock tons. And you can see how big 2012 and 2017 were. Uh, with the acreage and the yields we had at roughly 3.4 million tons in 2012 and about 3.5 million tons in 2017. And then to make it more current for the last few years, you can see that we were at 2018 and 19 at roughly 2.7 each, which was well below demand. And we started chipping away at the, at the supply and the pipeline. And then in 2020, we went up about 300,000 tons from 19 and produced right at a 3 million ton crop. And it was a, a very good high quality crop from all growing areas. But also the early, remember that the early estimates that were coming out in the summertime had the 2020 crop pegged at roughly 3.3 million farmer stock tons. But we just did not deliver that acreage mainly in the Southeast. Uh, and of course, West Texas had a horrible drought in 2020 and we do feel sorry for them and hopefully they can have a good production year this year. So that's where we are in terms of total production, producing a 3 million ton crop, high quality in 2020. And then this, as Ron mentioned earlier, this is one of my favorite slides. And this is the domestic consumption on a per capita basis in the United States. And this does not include oil stock, but you can see that we, in 2012, we were at 6.7 pounds per person. And look at the trend over time, as we have increased domestic consumption 
in the United States on a per head basis and up to in 2020, almost set right at 7.6 pounds per person. This is no accident. And you can see this trend started well before COVID hit. It, we were headed that way already. And this is just the effective work of all of the grower organizations and the grower checkoff dollars, the National Peanut Board, the Peanut Institute and others that are just giving the green light to people to go out and eat more peanuts. And, and it's evident that they're doing their jobs and doing it well, because this is an amazing slide. And we certainly think this will continue in the future and hope that it does. So good things looking at the domestic consumption in the United States. This is a look at exports. And this again is a very nice slide. When we go back to 2011 and 12, we were under 400,000 tons. And then we have seen increases coming through all of these years to where we had a peak in 2016 at just under a million <coughs> uh, farmer stock tons exported down a little bit. But in 2020, we export 910,000 tons. And that is from a volume standpoint, that is a great, great picture. But y'all, let's, let's stop one moment right here. And I wanna peel the onion back, take a few layers off of it and show you how things have changed in the export markets. And this is interesting. This is from the American Peanut Council uh, with their export statistics. In 2018, this is the US peanut exports and the percentage by the destination country or area. And as you can see in 2018, we exported roughly 31% to Europe, 17% to Asia, 19% to Canada, 22 to Mexico and the rest of the world with 6.6%. So real good balance, good balance in this slide. But now I'm going to flip it to the 2020 data. It's drastically different. You can see now we're exporting 52.4% to the Asian countries, Europe down to 7.8%, Canada and Mexico holding fairly the same as they were in 18, and then 4% in, uh, for the rest of the world, roughly. And this is a picture just to show you of these side by side. You can see how small the European market is for us just in three years and how the Asian market has actually increased with Mexico and Canada staying roughly the same. This is a drastic shift. So from a volume standpoint of exports, you would say we have healthy exports. And I would not argue that point. I agree with that point. The American Peanut Council and others have done a great job on getting these peanuts exported and helping promote us overseas. But when you look down at the bottom, the average price of our exports in 2018 was 63 cents a pound when we, remained, when we were higher in Europe. And in 2020, the average price was 52 cents a pound. That's 11 cents per pound difference. And a lot of it has to do with some of the quality issues that we had maybe out of the 19 crop, but it's a, just a drastic shift that we see in peanut export destinations. Um, and hopefully uh, we can get this back in a better balance with a higher value of our exports soon. So we saw the production, we saw the domestic consumption, we see exports, both are up, domestic and exports. And this leads us to the carry forward, which is a number that is a market indicator as we transition from an old crop to a new crop and how much is in the pipeline. And as you can see in 2012 and 2017, we had a carry forward of roughly 1.25 to 1.3 million farmer stock tons. And since 17, with the lower acreage in 18, lower acreage in 19, and then we saw the production in 20, you can see how we have actually chipped away at that large number from 17 to where in 19, it was roughly 900,000 tons. And in 2020, I've had it pegged, and I know some other analysts that I've talked to had it around the 860,000 ton mark. 
And that's a good number from when I'm speaking to a producer group, that is a pretty good healthy carry forward number, which means we'll have enough peanuts to finish out the year, but we're gonna need new crop peanuts in a quicker fashion than we would in some of these higher years. Now, this is another thing that is working for us in 2021. Um, this is average cotton price. And I know somebody's just gonna challenge me on that December 21 number. And I left it there for a reason, just to show you where we were. And hopefully that some growers were able to contract at that 85 plus number. Um, but you can see that we went into this year with really strong cotton prices. A year ago, September corn was 378 a bushel. When I made the slide, September corn was 490 a bushel. And I'm gonna look at my notes real quick. The problem is some of these prices have softened. Uh, this morning I looked, September corn was 481, not 490, and it's down five cents today. Um, soybeans really don't play in, but we go to December cotton, and I don't, if you haven't looked at the markets this morning, if it's to ruin your day, but December 21 cotton is at 77 and a half and not 85 and it's down almost three cents a pound this morning. But when these prices, even at this level, we're better than we were. But this gave growers the opportunity to have other crops competing for peanut acreage at higher prices, which I think affected our peanut prices following along with that so that they could maintain their acreage. And I know a lot of the contracts that came out here were well above what we had been getting the previous years. So this crop competition is real and it's been able to benefit uh, growers. Hopefully we'll have good production. Growers will be able to sell at a higher price and make some prop, uh, really good return on investments this year. Now, seeing these other crop prices leads me to this. This is the PLC payment and the market year average price that is used to uh, estimate it. And as you can see, it's been a wide range with the PLC in 2010 at $85, followed that with 11 and 12 with no PLC payments. And that was the year that uncontracted farmer stock in 11 went way up. The early offers in 12 were way up and we didn't get a PLC. That's the way the system is designed to work. Right now, the predictions on March the 9th down in the bottom right for 21 is a $115 uh, PLC payment. The reason I wanna offer this to you is we're getting the payments now from 2020, okay? We're going into a year of higher crop prices for peanuts, cotton, corn, and the that's going to factor into a lower PLC payment a year from now. So growers have to be keenly aware that because they're getting better, you know, contracting better prices now, that money won't come until next year. And we're getting the 20 money now. So they really need to be smart and try to save what they can out of these payments because if crop prices are low next year in 2021 or uh, 2022, we'll be looking at less revenue from the crop sales and probably a lot less revenue from the PLC payments. So that's the financial management thing that growers really need to be keen on um, if that scenario develops. We won't know that for a while. So I saw a recent report. I will wrap this up, uh, Doc, to keep you on time. Uh, Tyre and Spearman Center's report out on March 22nd, which was three days ago. And he summarized some of the data and said that exports uh, are still running about 10% above last year as China continues to buy in shell peanuts. Domestic consumption, which I know uh, Bob Parker will cover some of this, is up as well after six months. And he had a range in there of 3.4 to 5.9. Both great stories for us. We're moving more peanuts and people are eating more peanuts. And also the EU tariffs are back under some negotiation. 
And I don't think it's final yet, but the EU agreed to lift roughly $4 billion in tariffs on products that you can see on the slide, including nuts. So that might offer us some potential back into the, be more competitive in the European markets. And finally, he did say that some estimate uh, analysts are now saying that the ending stock is closer to 850,000 tons instead of what we thought earlier with the nine, what some thought earlier with the 996. And it's because we're just selling and moving more peanuts. So that's a comforting thing. So the carryout position has tightened over the last three years. We knew it would because of the peak that we had in 17. The increased demand in the domestic market and export markets almost increased is equal to the increase in production last year. So we're kind of flat compared to last year. We have done great in both of these markets, domestic and export. And I want you to read carefully, all the producers read carefully what I have underlined. These are your checkoff dollars at work, working for you. We're selling more peanuts abroad. We're eating more peanuts domestically. And these checkoff dollars are paying off both for the state organizations, National Peanut Board, and everybody that is getting the word, word out about the consumption of peanuts in the United States. Cotton corn and soy are in good positions and they have had very strong competition for peanut acreage. But at the same time, we do need to make sure we deliver an adequate supply of quality peanuts to the market so that we can maintain and continue this growth because it's critical that we continue this. I think well, I'll get down to that in a second. But at the same time, a lot of growers are going to evaluate which crops are going to provide the highest returns this year. And they know that rotations matter. And in deep, depressed times, we've seen that growers went to more peanuts. And the higher prices for cotton and corn provide this opportunity uh, on improving rotations. And finally, Dr. Mumford, who uh, surveyed all of the extension specialists around the country, averaged them all up and represented them at the pre, uh, American Peanut Shellers and Vine Points Association pre-harvest meeting. He said the acreage expectation in 21 is expected to be near where we were in 2020. And I think that's good. If we can have a good production year with the same acreage, I think we'll be fine. So Doc, that's uh, the end of my presentation. I'll be certainly glad to answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Marshall. Uh, as expected, you've given us an awful lot to think about there. Um, a lot of a lot of moving parts, and uh, growers focused on producing their crop also need to be focused on the business end of the deal. And and you've certainly given us a lot of education here. Uh, we could take a question if if uh, if we saw one, but in the meantime. The best way to do that is to go down to the chat feature and put your question in there. In there. I know Marshall will be on with us for a little while longer. If you have a question for Dr. Uh, Dr. Lamb, put it into the chat and then Josh will pick that out and we'll ask that question. Okay, okay moving on then. Right. Thank you, once, Marshall. Once again, thank you for inviting me. We appreciate you being with us. Marshall, you might stop sharing your screen. Uh, I forgot, Josh. Thank you. No problem. Okay, this time we'll uh, pitch it back to Les Crawl, the chairman of the Oklahoma Peanut Commission. Les, you're muted. There we go, second attempt. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Dr. Lamb. Appreciate those comments. Uh, another thing that Dr. Lamb's also involved in out of the USDA office there in Dawson, Georgia, is the uh, Peanut Profitability Award. I saw that we had uh, Ron Smith with the Farm Press on with us as well today. They're the, they're the sponsor of that award, and we've had numerous farmers from Oklahoma over the years that have won that uh, Southwest region for that Peanut Profitability Award. And we want to thank uh, Dr. Lamb and Southwest Farm Press for their efforts in uh, making that possible. Uh, at my uh, at this time, it's my pleasure as as the Oklahoma delegate for the National Peanut Board 
uh, to introduce our president of the uh, president and CEO of the National Peanut Board. That's uh, uh, Bob Parker, a good friend uh, of mine and, and certainly a good friend of Peanuts. He uh, joined us as president of the National Peanut Board about eight years ago. He's the president and CEO. Uh, we have gone through some numerous things in the National Peanut Board, including uh, strategic planning. One of the things that uh, uh, is in our matrix to see how we're doing. And, and uh, I still remember uh, Ed White from Alabama when he was chair, he said, let's put the, the hay down with the cows. How can we make peanut farming more profitable? And that's become the mission of the National Peanut Board. And certainly one of the, in that matrix, consumption per capita peanuts uh, is one of our uh, uh, benchmarks. And we've uh, uh, gone from 6.7 pounds, as Dr. Marshall said, in 2012 to 7.6 in 2020. So uh, uh, I, I think uh, also Bob Parker is going to be joined uh, by another friend of mine from Georgia, uh, the current chair of the National Peanut Board, Andy Bell. And I'm going to turn it over to Bob Parker and, and let him uh, take over from here. Thank you, Les. Well, I wish I could have been in Oklahoma today instead of here in Atlanta. Um, I'm going to, Josh, if I can, I'll try to just do the presentation live instead of doing the video. And uh, before I start, I just want to uh, introduce Andy Bell, our chairman. Andy's from Georgia. He's been on the National Peanut Board. This is his sixth year as a member. I also want to express my appreciation to Les as our member and Les as our uh, vice chair. He will chair the board next year. He's been a huge asset. Uh, Gail White is our uh, alternate from Oklahoma and a former chairperson of the National Peanut Board and did an amazing job as chair. So. I, uh, I thank Oklahoma for your contribution over the years to the leadership of the National Peanut Board. You've, uh, you've sent us very strong people over the years. Andy, would you like to say anything before I begin? I would just like to say I'm glad to be on and uh, enjoyed my visit to Oklahoma a couple of years ago and seeing the Oklahoma uh peanut production and just just glad to be on and, and glad to have Oklahoma in the on the National Peanut Board. Great. Thank you. Okay, let's see how it goes. This is always the most stressful thing is getting it to share properly. But uh can you all see it now? Looks great, yeah. Bob. Okay, good. I'm going to I'm gonna try to present this live, but I have a video and backup. So um, y'all had a great year last year. As Marshall, Marshall said, uh, the only year that you, you beat your yield was 2017. And uh, based on our calculations, using certified acres and inspected tonnage, not using the NAS numbers, but actually what was expected uh, is grown in Oklahoma. We account for what moves across state lines into and out of Oklahoma. Uh, your average yield was 4,138 pounds in 20, uh, compared to 4,143 in 2017. I'm really encouraged by what we've seen with strong prices for other commodities that we've seen this spring that uh, cause shellers to respond with generous contract offers. The, uh, the, the prices have declined for some of the other commodities, but I think it did, it did bring some, some good contract offers. Um, I think that uh, kind of echoing what Marshall said that 996,000 tons of carryout is forecast by USDA is, I think, very high. And I agree that it's somewhere down in the, that 850,000 ton number. USDA is not, I think, accounting for the growth in the domestic consumption that we saw last year. 
would continue to see through the first six months of the marketing year. Our marketing year for peanuts ends on July 31st. Um, we're, our stated goal at the National Peanut Board is eight pounds per capita. We're at 7.6 now. That's a record high. Uh, we're up for the six months of, of the 2021 marketing year. And a lot of things can happen. It'll be hard to maintain that rate of growth, but we're doing really well. The interesting thing on the export side, and Marshall noted the uh, lower average price in exports. However, we had a lot of poor quality farmer stock in the 19 crop. And the Chinese bought that. They loaded, we loaded it on containers and we shipped the, the farmer stock to China. We, uh, we took those peanuts out of the supply stream here in the US. But one of the positive things I think that needs to be considered is that the US shelling capacity didn't have to be devoted to shelling poor quality farmer stock. They were able to focus on better quality farmer stock and meeting the demand for our edible customers in the United States, Canada, Europe. And we would have had major problems trying to get those peanuts shelled uh, had we had to. So I think it was a good thing. It did lower the average price, but um, I don't think those peanuts would have brought a good price wherever they may have ended up. Marshall showed you the uh, the chart a while ago, and on my screen at least, the uh, the 7.6 pounds per capita number on the far right is cut off, but uh, it's it is a record price. We're very encouraged by the continued consumption in U.S. peanuts and the uh, the move back by consumers to peanut butter and even candy and other products during the pandemic. So how do we consume peanuts in the United States? Peanut butter is our main market, 56% last year. We run around 55 to 60% of our market to peanut butter, followed by peanut snacks at 20%, candy at 17, in shells at six, and other uses at three. A really interesting recent development is that the Planters brand was sold by Kraft to or Kraft Heinz to Hormel. The Planters brand has, I think, um, not received the attention from Kraft that uh, maybe Planters has received in the past, and Hormel paid a big price for it. Uh, as far as the multiple of total sales, it was over three times total gross annual sales, which tells me that Hormel is gonna really put some effort into this brand in order to justify the price they paid for it. It also tells me that there was probably some competition out there to try to buy planners. It is an iconic American brand. And so maybe we'll see some other ventures into the snack uh, category from other companies down the road. So what do we do in the market? One of the things, if, if you watch TV advertising, you see that there's a lot of uh, focus from brands talking about how they do good, maybe how they're donating to different causes. And that's been sort of a theme of, of what we've uh, been working on is uh, spreading good. And we're doing this through digital efforts and um, it, it's been successful. It's something that the younger generations, millennials and Gen Z really want to see. They want to associate with brands that peanuts are a brand that are doing good for the community at large and for specific communities and for people and for pets. So a lot of our efforts have been focused in that. Something that uh, we did in in 20, when the pandemic began, and we saw that we were going to lose ballpark sales of in-shell peanuts, we had some, some money freed up because we weren't able to travel and attend a lot of events. We shifted some of our budget to television advertising on the Fox network with uh, Major League Baseball.
And we got a really good reception on that. And we ended the year uh, July 31st with actually a little bit of a growth in the in shell peanut category. And snack also grew. So we focused on snack peanuts and in shells. So our spreading good campaign uh, was well received by consumers. We look at impressions. We got over 343 million impressions. That means somebody looked at it, but we also got 2.9 million engagements. That means that somebody looked at it, maybe on Twitter, they shared it or they liked it or they commented in some way. And engagement is, is what really drives things. Uh, we also got a lot of video views. And from those, we got very favorable responses. And we also were picked up in media because of some of this activity. One of the things that we're gonna be doing in 2021 is um, an activity. We've seen interest in a lot of do-it-yourself projects at home. That's why you can't find lumber maybe or building materials, but there's also been a huge growth in, in, in interest in gardening. And so we thought that it would be a, a good project, a good promotion to actually provide seed to consumers to plant their own peanuts in their own garden or in planters. And we're gonna be sharing peanut seed. We're gonna have an inf a gardening influencer who is going to tell them how to grow peanuts and how to manage them. We think that will really help people connect and understand how peanuts grow. So this is the campaign, Grow It Yourself. We're in development now. We partnered with a seed company that will handle the seed uh, going to consumers. There'll be uh, small packets of Virginia seed that they can grow themselves or they can share with neighbors. And it'll be enough for about two row feet of, of uh, peanuts in a garden. An annual event that we have had great success with is the Next Gen Food Summit. We started out calling it the Millennial Food Summit, and now we call it Next Gen because the uh, Gen Z group is now one year out of college, the first of that wave, and they are coming into their own and we're really focusing in those generations because baby boomers like myself have pretty much made our consumption decisions. We know what we're gonna eat. We're not gonna change easily, but the millennials and the Gen Z generations are still finding their way. They're still making decisions on what they eat. And they've been bombarded with the idea that peanuts aren't as healthy as almonds. Uh, they've also been the first generations to be exposed to uh, friends, counterparts with peanut allergies. And so we're focusing with these, these uh, consumers. This event that we have, we usually do in person. We bring in influencers and journalists and we talk about peanuts. We talk about uh, how to use peanuts in recipes, the health benefits of consuming peanuts. We talk about peanut allergy to make sure that they have the right facts. We bring in famous chefs and have them do demonstrations and interaction with the attendees. And we also uh, take them to a wine dinner somewhere, uh, to a winery in, in California. Uh, and, and this helps really draw the people to these events. Last year, we were in the pandemic and we couldn't do it in person. So we had a virtual event where Chef Kevin Gillespie, who's a nationally renowned chef, did a cooking demonstration from his home kitchen. We sent the ingredients for the recipe to all of the attendees so that they could cook along with Kevin from their own homes. And we also sent some wine for them to sample from the winery that we would have uh, had, had the dinner. And it was uh, hugely uh, successful. Uh, we, had a, we had a larger group than we normally would have because we were able to do, it, to do it virtually. And we had good attendance because I think we sent them the wine and they, uh, they felt obligated to participate. 
Another area of focus is with retail dietitians. Your major grocery store chains, whether it be Hy-Vee, Giant, Publix, Kroger, Walmart, have dietitians on staff. And these dietitians are hugely influential in what they serve in their prepared meals section, but even in product placement in the aisles. And so we have an agency that is, is uh, working specifically in this area for us. Uh, they've got really strong experience in working with dietitians and retail dietitians. They've got a huge network and that's been a very uh, effective promotion and effort. Y'all know I'm not going to talk to you and not talk about allergy. And we've got <laughs> some really good news in this area this year. The dietary guidelines for Americans were released the last week of December. Secretary Purdue told the USDA staff that he wanted the dietary guidelines released before he left office. We had a conversation with the people that are over the WIC program, Women, Infants, and Children's program, uh, back in November, sharing our concerns that we were, con we were uh, worried that the WIC program wasn't embracing early introduction like they should. In fact, what the WIC program does is they, they do food packages for uh, infants, for families with infants. And they also, one of the requirements is for the mom to participate, she has to go through counseling with WIC uh, experts on nutrition. Some of the WIC uh, packages included peanut butter, but many states did not choose to include peanut butter because they were concerned about the choking hazard and they were waiting until age two to include peanut butter. That's too late. That by age two, peanut allergies have already had a chance to develop. And so I set up a, a, a call with the deputy undersecretary that oversees the WIC program or oversaw. He's gone now with the transition in, in administrations. And he assured me that the new dietary guidelines would include this language that you see on the screen. Introducing peanut containing foods in the first year reduces the risk that an infant will develop a food allergy to peanuts. The importance of having this in the US dietary guidelines is that it codifies early introduction within the huge uh, bureaucracy of USDA and the WIC program. Now, if WIC, programs don't include peanut butter and counseling on early introduction in their program, they're not in compliance with the dietary guidelines. It's huge. It, and it doesn't just have ramifications in WIC, but throughout USDA. Let's talk about WIC. They serve half of the children in the United States. It's really sad that 50% of all babies born in the United States qualify for this program but they do. We have 4 million live births a year in the United States, meaning that 2 million of these babies will qualify for the WIC program. This is a huge population. We have a chance to intervene and prevent peanut allergy. There have also been a number of products released in 2020 and, and, and maybe even before that focus on early introduction. We always say that Early introduction is easy, that you can just use peanut butter or peanut flour diluted in breast milk or water and do the job just as well. But some parents are uncomfortable with it and want to uh, be able to buy something off the shelf that will help them. If you'll notice on the top left, there's a product called Mighty Me, Mission Mighty Me. It's a peanut puff product that's designed specifically for early in introduction. Down on the bottom left, this Earth's Best is also a puff product that's marketed broadly and they are uh, actually branding with Sesame Street. Uh, they are in Target and Whole Foods and a number of other retailers. We've even seen big companies move into this area. At the top right, you see a Gerber product that's a, a puffed peanut product. 
that has entered the marketplace. And then the original uh, Bamba is also in the United States. That was an Israeli product that uh, goes back many years and is believed to be the reason why there's so little peanut allergy in Israel because it's such a popular product for baby first foods. At the top center of the Happy Baby product is an actual squeezable baby food that contains peanuts, as well as the bottom right peanut pumpkin pie. So we're, we're seeing a lot of products come into the marketplace. And we're also seeing some actual treatments for peanut allergy. Now, the world's first treatment for peanut allergy called Palforzio was introduced and approved by FDA as a prescription product in 2020. It's really nothing more than a precisely dosed peanut flour product used for oral immunotherapy. The idea behind oral immunotherapy is Let's give the baby or the child a small dose of peanut powder and let's over time increase it slowly to the point where the child builds up tolerance to peanut. So if they accidentally ingest peanut, they will uh, not have a, an adverse reaction. Very few children will be fully cured from this product, but it, it will provide a lot of peace of mind to families. Another product that is in development and seeking FDA approval is uh, epicutaneous immunotherapy. Really took a lot of practice for me to be able to say that, or EPIT, or the easiest way to say it is a peanut patch. It's peanut protein that is on this adhesive patch that simply is absorbed into the skin and over time will help the child develop uh, tolerance to peanut protein in the same way that the oral immunotherapy is. It's not as effective in the studies, but a lot of parents are not under any circumstances going to allow their child to ever actually ingest peanut protein. So this is a, a really safe alternative. And we're hoping that maybe they'll get approval in 2021. Some other products that are being worked on, we see biologics, and there are even uh, developers that are working on potential vaccines, which will be a, a total possible cure or certainly a, a very reliable prevention down the road. You know, I'm going to talk about research and sustainability while, while I'm talking to you, too. We track what we've invested in research in our 20 year history, $38 million in counting toward peanut production research as Marshall uh, laid out the average US yields, which uh, we see some, some short term declines, but we're still so much higher than we were 10 years ago. It's, it's unbelievable. Another area of research we work in is partnered with the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, which is part of USDA, where we will commit to contributing a dollar and they'll match it with a dollar. In fact, we have been very successful with this program. $871,000 that we've committed to it has actually generated two and a half million dollars in matching funds. So we're always looking for, for ways that we can uh, find other research dollars. This is an interesting thing that we're working on this year. We're partnering with the uh, University of Tennessee, actually funding a research project with them, looking for improved internet connectivity in rural areas. And we're partnering with the United Soybean Board. So we've got a really big footprint here. They're starting out, the researchers are starting out focusing on our board members and our alternates looking at what kind of internet connectivity they have at their home and at their farms, looking at ways that maybe they can improve their connectivity and their speed uh, through new hardware or through new, new service providers. And once they discover how to improve their connectivity, then we'll be able to share it with the broader community. So in Les's case, Andy's case, Gail's case, they will look at that and then from there, we'll be able to communicate to the people in their communities on how to improve that. I don't have to tell you all how important having good, reliable, high-speed internet is to you, to your farming operations. Precision agriculture is the thing of the future. Data, real-time data is gonna be important as you are out in your fields and you're 
uh, you're trying to, to do precision fertilizer application or irrigation application, monitoring yield. We had a really good call with SpaceX. If you're familiar with SpaceX, they are a spinoff of the Tesla auto manufacturer, Elon Musk. SpaceX is in the process of launching thousands of satellites into low Earth orbit. And the idea behind low Earth orbit is unlike the uh, traditional satellite internet that we've had that has a, a long lag time, uh, is that type of internet is very slow and very difficult to have high speed. These low Earth orbit satellites will be very quick. They will cover the Earth like a blanket and we will have full U.S. coverage by the end of this year is what they're telling me. And behind them, Amazon is also going to launch low Earth orbit satellites. I think that's going to be one of the best possibilities for high speed Internet coming to your farm. This is my favorite slide in the presentation. These are uh, photos that I took last fall at a USDA plot in Georgia. The photo on the right is a, I think, totally resistant, if not immune plant to leaf spot. And the one on the left is a traditional variety that was planted right side by side with it. These peanuts were not sprayed at all for leaf spot. So we have found, our researchers have found genetic markers to find the least spot trait and they're working on other traits, other diseases and other traits that they'll be able to back cross into high performing varieties. And this is something that I think is just years away, maybe five years away from actually being available in some commercial varieties. This is very exciting. This I think validates our effort as the peanut board in supporting genomics research and supporting scientists like Dr. Chamberlain. And um, it's, it's beginning to pay off. I think we're, we're really close to seeing some real benefits coming from this. So at this time that completes my presentation, please, uh, if you're not receiving our electronic newsletter, uh, send us an email at peanuts at nationalpeanutboard.org. And if you're not receiving our magazine PQ, you can also request it at the same email address. Thank you for having me. I hope to see you in person next year. Thank you, Bob. Again, you've given us a lot to think about there. Really appreciate the great work that the National Peanut Board is doing through uh, grower funded uh, uh, efforts. And um, uh, we, we're so appreciative of the payoff that we are seeing. Thank you for being with us today. And we're certainly looking forward to in-person opportunities in the future. It's a pleasure. That is an amazing picture of that leaf spot deal. Is that, is that some of uh, Brenneman's work down there in Dawson? Or it's uh, Corley Holbrook is actually um, Holbrook. working on that with Peggy Osias Aikens and, and then Dr. Tim Brenneman, who's a plant pathologist, is also helping them with uh, rating and, and other things, which Bob Parker could rate that plot. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it was to see it in person was amazing. I mean, there was no leaf spot in there and it had not had one spray. I know. In Oklahoma, you don't have quite the least spot pressure that Georgia has and, and the Southeast has, but y'all do have some, don't you? I mean, you have it, to spray for least spot. Absolutely. Yeah, we normally do like about a three spray, spray regiment, and uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, uh, Sclarentina has been our big deal, and, and Dr. Chamberlain and USDA has really come up with some good varieties that have uh, have uh, resistance to that as well. Yeah, Unless I think we've gotten some of that material from Corley, it's in our breeding program now, just FYI. And, I, and I'll tell you all something else about our investment in the genomics and the breeding programs is that 
you're not paying the technology fees for peanut seed and you're not going to have to pay the technology fees for peanut seed that you're paying for cotton for corn for soybeans for a lot of the crops out there that that were developed by private companies uh, peanut acres run around a million and a half million six acres a year we're too small to draw the the interest of the Syngentas. And I thought that was a negative for a long time because they were focusing on cotton at 17 million acres and corn at 90 million acres. But it's kept the breeding focus in, in public research universities and kept this technology in the public domain. And it's gonna, it's gonna be a huge benefit to farmers down the road. I mean, y'all are paying three cent a pound royalty for your seed. So if you're planting are you planting a, a 120 pounds, say, of seed per acre on average less? So more like 90. Paying, more like 90. So you're paying less than $3 an acre in technology fees for your seed. That's just amazing. And that it's a it's a good thing. And, and I don't see that changing because we're developing these new seed varieties and, and finding these traits with uh, people like Dr. Chamberlain and USDA researchers and university researchers and Dr. Lab, uh, Lamb's outfit in Dawson, Georgia as well. That's some additional great points there, Bob. Thank you for sharing that. You can... Uh, it's there. <clears throat> okay. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Travis Paskey. Uh, Travis is a professor and extension plant pathologist for the University of Arkansas, uh, Department of Division of Agriculture, Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology, and he works out of Lone Oak, Arkansas. Uh, Travis earned a BS degree in plant and soil sciences from Tar Tarleton State University in Stephenville, Texas. He received his MS degree in plant pathology from Oklahoma State University, so you know that he's uh, acquainted with our state and with our crops and received his PhD in plant pathology from Texas A&M University. Uh, his applied research and extension program identifies practical solutions to manage plant pathogenic nematodes in cotton, corn, and soybeans. And further, his program investigates the integrated management of fungal, foliar, and soil-borne diseases in corn, soybeans, and peanuts. Think of Arkansas as a peanut producing state as a relatively new thing. Uh, but I do remember uh, working with Lanny Ashlock with some field days more than almost 30 years ago in, uh, in Northeast Arkansas, just uh, Southwest of Memphis. And uh, there weren't very many acres at that time, but uh, it showed a lot of potential. And a, and a lot of that uh, potential is now coming to fruition. So we're really glad to have uh, Travis on with us. We still see Bob's slide though. Um, Josh, have you got a, a method to fix that? Travis was sharing and then it went away. Yeah, let me let me share again. There you go. Okay. We see you, Travis. Okay, now you can see me? Yep. Okay. All right. Can you see my slides now too? Not yet. Not yet. We did, but we don't anymore. Okay. Well, it shows it's sharing. Oh, wait, here we go. There we go. There we Looks go. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Ron, and, and thanks for the invite. Uh, you know, uh, when I grew up in the 80s and uh, 90s uh, in Central Texas, my, my grandfather was a peanut farmer. We were planting those Spanko and Pronto Spanish peanuts. Uh, and so... Uh, Someone mentioned earlier, I think, I think it was you, Ron, it was about those 6,000 pounds per acre. We didn't get close to that. And so it's interesting now in Arkansas, if, if our growers don't get to 6,000 pounds, they think they've done something wrong. So I can certainly appreciate uh, where we've come from and to where we are now. So uh, when I was asked to give this talk, I, I, I kind of felt uh, it's certainly honored, but with uh, Arkansas, the peanut production is, you know, recent and, and you guys have had a longer history with it. So, uh, but first I'd like to give you a little, just a quick introduction here, where we're at in the state. Uh, Ron mentioned this area, uh, this is Memphis here. 
So this is where the, the peanut production was last year, just to give you a snapshot. This is Mississippi and Craighead counties. So this is the Boot Hill in Missouri and 65% of our peanuts are produced in these two counties. Um, in 2010, when there was that renewed interest, it was these two counties, uh, Randolph and Lawrence County. And these are the two counties that have the sclerotini issues. Everything else so far is sclerotinia free, uh, but certainly do have other uh, disease issues. So it's, it's really been new, um, especially through my career, uh, changing from, from one uh, state to the other. I never thought I'd be back and working with peanuts, but uh, here we are. So this is uh, uh, certainly nice. This is a, just the agricultural map of Arkansas, just to, to show the other cropping systems that are there. So you can see where my attention would go to uh, soybeans. Uh, is the green, the blue is uh, rice and the, uh, the, the red is cotton. So you can see this Mississippi County is a, a big production, high input, high yield expectation county. Of course, when you look at uh, Arkansas as a state uh, compared to uh, the other places that I've been, Oklahoma and Texas, um, you know, I grew up in a 25 inch rainfall belt. Now I'm in a 50. Um, I joke with my mom back home that we don't even use water hoses up here. We sell them, give them away. Of course, they don't think that's very funny when they're in a drought and her plants are dying and their cattle are starving. So uh, I use that as a uh, pointing opportunities. So diseases that we have, same as you guys, whether you call uh, Scrosia and Rothsii, Southern Blight, Southern Stem Rot, or White Mold, usually about July 1st, uh, early on, I, I would spend time with consultants to tell them when to look for Southern Blight, what to look for, so some of that flagging. If you're lucky enough and it didn't rain, uh, you can see the hyphae below, and then of course the Scrosia which is a, a, a telltale sign for this disease and a way to identify it from uh, sclerotinia. And most of them for, for the most part uh, got it. They're, they're really kind of used to it um, given the wide host range of this particular disease. It's not uncommon to see it on soybeans. And here it is, uh, if you can see if you're close, here's the sclerotia, they're a little out of focus, but all this white hyphae is um, sclerotia and rossii. So, our growers use peanuts as a rotation to reduce uh, southern root knot nematode. And, uh, and this is one of those cases where you see a, an additive effect with uh, southern blight and root knot nematode on soybeans. Um, although it's not ideal for that rotation, it does happen. Um, just some of the curious, interesting things that go on in Arkansas and the Mid-South as far as disease management. So this is sclerotinia blight uh, you're most familiar with. To me, it is the most awesome disease as a researcher. It's the worst disease as a, a farmer. Um, you know, a perfect example of a blight. You go in, one day the, the plants look great, the next day they're just completely dead. Um, I identified this in 2014 as I was giving a talk in the field. I actually saw these, these white stems. I really don't know what I said after that point, but I know we ended the meeting much sooner than I wanted to. Uh, to confirm that this was in Arkansas. Initially, I thought it might be uh, seed borne, talking with uh, Charles Simpson in Texas. Uh, but after a while, I found it clustered more and, and in several fields. So um, it's either been there on soybean and we just didn't know it. Uh, there's some reports that it reproduces on soybean, shows symptoms. I've never seen it on soybean in Arkansas, uh, but uh, certainly could be a a non-symptomatic type host, or we get late in the season, the soybeans senesce, they mature, we, we don't see the symptoms there. But anyway, we've got it in, in a couple of counties. And then the last one that really showed up to be a problem for us were the leaf spots. Um, a couple of my, my prize winning photos, of course, uh, they're not always this uh, aggressive, sometimes worse, sometimes less, but early leaf spot um, with the classic yellow ring and the, the spores on the upper side of the leaf. And then late leaf spot uh, with the, uh, the spores structures on the bottom side of the leaf. So um, again, great opportunities for educating uh, consultants and farmers uh, with some of these images as well as uh, onset of disease. I don't see early leaf spot very much. Late leaf spot tends to be our problem. So uh, it really starts coming in at about September, October um, and, and can be pretty dramatic. Um, you know, uh, 
Bob had a picture, I think, early on with his lead spot. Um, this is my lead spot one, so please bring on that resistance. Uh, this is a, to date down here, you look at that date, that's way too late for, for peanuts to be in the field, of course. This farmer, this is uh, north of, of Memphis. Um, he just, it kept raining and raining. He couldn't get in, but uh, you can see the varietal difference here. Tough Runner 511, which our growers like, and here's Georgia 09B. Um, he just couldn't spray anymore after this, but uh, under these severe um, situations, of course, you can get quite a difference in that variety. So hopefully not to see a whole lot of that anymore, but uh, we can get pretty severe, all that moisture. So our varieties uh, in the state are, are pretty much those three, 09B, 06, and 297. <clears throat> our soybean farmers are, oh, uh, they keep waiting for the next big thing in peanuts. And, and they, they expect like soybeans, the varieties will change every three years. And they don't. And so sometimes they're kind of surprised why, why they're not. But so we stuck with the, really the first two or probably about 80% of our, our production. But when we do get something new, I like to look at it first in some of my small plots. These are my uh, research plots at the Newport Extension Station. This is in central Arkansas, um, just uh, uh, north of Little Rock, basically. So these are soybeans in the back. And, and this soil, um, to a astute agronomist like Ron, he would look at that and say that soil is tight. It is. Uh, I, I call it marginal soil. But I do have diseases here, so that's why I'm here. Uh, Southern blight, sclerotinia blight, and then late leaf spot, which can get pretty nasty here as well if it gets into October, November with some of our rainfall. So this is the, the variety plot I had last year. Uh, 2019, it rained so much, uh, we didn't get any yield data. Uh, again, this is not the, the high yield production area of the state, but it does give you an idea of some of the variety susceptibility. Uh, this Georgia 12Y, this was uh, actually looks pretty good. Uh, I think there's some reports of it with resistance, but uh, look good in our isolates as well. Um, Lariat, here's, here's one of y'all's varieties, uh, similar to, to 06G. Um, and, and 06G really is one of those that's supposed to be better. Um, it, it, it should be better than 09B, but I kind of see the inverse here. Of course, statistically, it's all the same. Numerically, uh, there's some nice trends going on there. If I would rank those, I'd love to do, you know, slides like this for our growers uh, to put them together. I haven't looked at these enough to really separate them out. So I just put this Georgia 12Y as moderately resistant uh, until I can look at it a couple of more years. So this is some of the information we put in our quick facts as well. It's our um, annual publication for information on peanuts. Same slide, this is sclerotinia blight. Um, and of course, the Georgia 12 Y in, in our trial looked pretty good. Uh, this Georgia 18 RU, this is a, a standard peanut where everything else except 06 is high oleic. So it looked well. And I thought that was going to be kind of a fluke, but uh, 18 RU looked pretty good last year. Um, here's Lariat, kind of middle of the pack. Um, and 06, as well as this Auburn line. Um, has been pretty consistent as being the most susceptible in, in the, the trials that I've had. So um, certainly uh, opportunities there. Again, that's only about 7% of our acreage, but certainly for the two farmers there, it's important. One thing I find very interesting with the, the Arkansas farmer to, to do a test is 350 acres. To get started is 700 and like in Mississippi County, there's three growers that have over 2,000 acres each. So when they get in, they get into it big and um, they're making it work. Um, rotation, as someone said earlier, is, is certainly going to be a challenge as we, we get into the future. But we have a lot of root knot nematode issues, so peanut is a great fit for us. This is the um, lately spot. Um, I think we did a little bit better with our fungicide applications here. This is at Florida scale. Uh, so a four would be about 25%, less than 25% defoliation. Pretty happy with this. Uh, we were trying to allow the, the so uh, soil borne diseases to take off. So not much variation there. But these are our yields. Again, um, 
no bragging rights there. I'm not going to win any awards. Um, this is, we, we actually harvested late, like in November. So I think we lost some of those that may mature early, um, especially like the 09B. We get a lot of digger loss with it where, where the peg strength uh, tends to weaken. So um, in this trial, the tough runner 511 did well. I had an on site variety trial where the 297 and 06 was the best in, in our area. So um, this is really, I would take more of the disease screening part of this than the variety, the yield response uh, in this case. So uh, just Georgia 07W, um, kind of middle of the pack for the sclerotinia, lower here, but in some of our um, on-farm variety trials actually look pretty good. All right, so with, with all those different varieties, we, we don't have resistance to each and every one of them. So uh, certainly fungicides and, and fungicide uh, efficacy is important to our farmers as, as well as uh, uh, every peanut farmer or, or soybean farmer. What's, what's the best and, and when do I use it? Um, this is just our mud master. We do a lot of fungicide trials, so it just has a multi-boom and one of them is driving, the other one's just flipping switches on and off. They're, they're spraying boron here, so uh, no, no fungicides or pesticides in this photo. So when, when I was a student, I always liked to hear about what was new. And um, so these are the, and I've got in quotes kind of new. Uh, these may be very familiar to some of you. Uh, they're new to me. I haven't had a lot of fungicide trials in, in Arkansas. There's been a lot more soybean trials. Whoa, uh, that happened. Right. I'm using the online portion of mine. I, okay. See if I can get back to the show. Okay. So Miravis or Miravis is Syngenta's new product. Uh, Pendaflumatafin, uh, FRAC code seven, so an SDHI. All the new fungicides coming out are SDHIs. And, and I was really impressed that starting in, in Arkansas, with the last few years, five or six years, the number of fungicides, a variety of fungicides have, have come in. It's just been tremendous. Almost everything new has been this FRAC code seven. Um, so it, it has me a little concerned. Uh, they're doing a lot of premixes here in soybeans. And so I know I've seen some of uh, John Damicone's uh, trials and as a leaf spot material, this looks really good. Excalia, this is the first time I've looked at it. I haven't quite learned how to say that word, so I won't. Uh, valence focusing on Southern blight with it. Provisol has been around a while. Uh, that's BASS uh, FRAC code three, so a DMI or Trizol. Uh, focusing on the leaf spots. This is one of those that you definitely need to get out early. Uh, rather than late, and they realize that. So I think in their programs, they're talking about um, getting out ahead of disease, and it's not one of those that's going to uh, recover from a, a high incidence. Umbra, which is new to me, but old materials, uh, which is which Convoy and Top Guard. Um, and so uh, nice combination of a frac code uh, seven and three from Nishino. Lucinto is FMC's material. And then absolute max, I don't have any data on the absolute max, um, but I see in, in Bayer's RX programs that they're starting to use this. So that's uh, basically Folicure and Jim, uh, if, if you're familiar with Jim. Um, that's the only uh, frac code three and 11 that has come on, um, but uh, uh, those, are, those are some of the newer ones. Some of these I have a little bit of data on, I'm gonna share with you quickly. Um, others I don't have so much, but uh, we move through it quickly and it's recorded. Take a look. Back at Newport, so my trials are really close together. A previous crop soybean, uh, don't do that. Um, I'm, I'm doing it as a researcher just to have disease development. You can see here, we harvested really late. We actually dug October the 15th and, and the rains just kept us out. So uh, probably had some, some yield loss due to that. So this is, um, the trial here, uh, the, the timings, basically the, the main fungicides were three times. So like, you know, Omega here with the, uh, the, the Southern Blight, 
not so much Convoy. That's about what I expect with it. Um, Umbra is the same AI. If you're putting those out at that rate, you're putting out a little less of the uh, Flutalanil in the Umbra, but it still looked good. And the Excalia here uh, looked as, as they, they, they marketed. All the others pretty close. Um, looking at the Sclerotinia blight, um, really didn't expect that from, from these uh, fungicides here, but that may be just some of the uh, inconsistencies of the uh, uh, fungus in my trials. Kind of would expect this from Omega. Uh, this MCW product is uh, Adamas, and from what I can understand, it's also Fluazinam. So I don't know if this is just variation between these two or um, you know, a rate response, um, the amount of product that is being put out here. And not much from the latest. We did a pretty good job here, this being a soil born. We focused on the soil born diseases. We didn't focus on the leaf spot so much. So we got more separation here and, and this probably had a, a, also an impact in some of our yield. But the approach FEMA product looked good for us. This is another one of those that needs to be out early. Uh, you don't wanna uh, kind of get a re revenge uh, application with it, but this is one of those products that our growers can access. Uh, Elatus uh, looked really good and, and Fontillus were, were our top ones, but the, the latest material having the highest yield. And, and those look a little bit better yield response uh, given they're all the same variety. Moving on just to a lease spot trial that we had. Um, did a uh, uh, muscle ADB, a chlorothalonil TEB first, approach Prima, and then followed with our treatments. I did this because usually the end of August, early September is when late leaf spot picks up in, in my trials. So early on, um, a lot of these uh, fungicides here all look pretty good. Um, Dextramax is a mancazeb plus a zoxystrobin. So um, going back to some old chemistries there. Um, Revitec is a BASS product. It has Preaxor plus Provisol. So if you look at Revitec and Provisol, um, this one has two more fungicides in it. And so you kind of go to the end, you get that expectation that it's going to work a little bit better. And it did. Of course, our disease pressure picked up. I think some of my issues here were probably a little bit of timing. Um, I, I should have got these out more frequently and, and I spread them out too far being uh, about 21 days apart. But uh, getting everything on the peanuts when you're trying to do the, uh, some of the other commodities um, is a juggling act. Um, Umbra looked good here, the Revitec Provo Silver, and here uh, again, the Miravis material, not just dynamite, but uh, certainly better than some of the others. And the Approach Prima worked okay for us. The, the hardest part I find is, is, is a pathologist presenting some of this information and then growers tell me I can't get that. And so some of these I try to add that are more soybean related because it's in uh, um, our chemical warehouses here in Arkansas. All right, um, I thought I'd end with, with just some of the keys to fungicide success, and, and I'm going to move through these kind of quickly. Is of course, correct diagnosis. Um, most of you who have been in peanuts for a long time probably recognize this. This is not southern blight. It's Phanerochete. This is a wood rotting fungus, but we see it about June, and so uh, there's no reason to really target a, a southern blight fungicide application. Uh, until uh, later on. Of course, uh, you, you, everyone in, in this audience is probably familiar with these two. I, I had a, a consultant contact me and say, hey, um, I've got that white mold. Um, again, I don't like that term because of this. To a trained eye, this is Southern blight and this is sclerotinia blight. And he was putting out one shot of convoy material. So he was doing some good here. He was doing actually no good over here. So. Uh, again, correct diagnosis and knowing what you have in the field. Um, that's a lot of my education program too. Um, of course, efficacy, we, we talked about a little bit, uh, some of those like Provisol and things getting out early and storage can also be uh, uh, important for success. This year, uh, we got to, I think, right at zero degrees. I'm sure you guys did too. Uh, I went out and checked my uh, storage room. We have a high-low thermometer. Uh, which was really good so that I knew uh, mine was at the right temperature, uh, that we were good to be able to utilize those for the next season. 
um, proper mixing. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of that, but, but I, you know, it's kind of nice to share war stories. I had a, a farmer that was leaving on vacation and he was going to put a fungicide out. He thought, well, I've got some extra karate, which is a pyrethrin, and I'm going to throw that in the mix. Well, we got hot and dry. His father went out and looked at the field. And he's like, what is all this? He had spider mites that were really bad. And so he, he, he you know, self-inflicted issues. So again, proper mixing, sprayer calibration. I talked about application timing. Um, I think we're in the state where we need to kind of shore up those. We've been about 21 days and we're gonna have to start narrowing that gap uh, with, with some of our environmental conditions that we have at the end of the season. Sometimes we can get out, sometimes we can't. Um, about 30% of our acreage is pivot irrigated and the rest of it is furrow irrigated. And that makes for a certainly interesting challenge when you're trying to get good coverage with a fungicide. Here I can water in, here I can't. Um, and even though we go out at night or at 20 gallons per acre, um, I'm always seeing more disease here. So that's certainly a, a challenge for us, but if you're, it certainly can, can water the whole field. It's, it's nice, but uh, it's uh, certainly something we have to work through in our state. Um, so I like to talk about coverage sometimes. All right, the last and just quickly is just fungicide resistance. Um, really not as a big of an issue probably in peanuts it is for soybeans. When I started in 2012, I walked out to a field where a farmer had sprayed quadris. Um, he liked to use it for the yield bump. He put out four ounces instead of six. He did that for a couple of years and uh, he had the worst frog eye leaf spot I've ever seen. So that's a Cercospora pathogen. So two things work with fungicide resistance. The fungicide, so this one is a, a high risk with the QOIs or the strobilurins. And when one fails, typically the other fails. And I always put a light switch here because it works like a light switch. It works one time and the next time it's not gonna work. Um, things like Cercospora are also at a high risk. And so, uh, I think Albert Colbreth uh, reported in 2016 that some of the headline was not working as well. Of course, that's in Georgia. That's not here, but of course, just kind of FYI, kind of being aware of. The DMI fungicides, I like to use a dimmer switch. Um, they're at a meeting risk. So when one of them quits working, the other one might, but they slowly, um, you know, dim over time. They're really bright at first and then get quiet. So Tabiconazole, we've known about it in Georgia for a few years. And I found this paper again from Albert, uh, must be in some of his field plots, or some of these other triazoles, uh, the, the dome arcs, the tilts, the, the top guards were less effective than Bravo. So um, use and abuse and, and uh, that can happen. Also, these are, these are cheaper fungicides and some of the, uh, the strobies. So uh, we're certainly seeing this here. SDHIs, I, I don't see any or hear of any resistance. Um, and I, I think it'd be more like a light switch than a dimmer switch, but uh, so far nothing in peanuts there are in some other crops. So management wise, uh, most of you are very familiar with this using the label rates. Um, I've got one consultant in the state. He's decided that he can use half rates and he'll just go out more frequently. Well, he's setting himself up for a big problem. And, and that's something we'll have to deal with. Rotating mode of action. Um, in, in our state, we have a lot of problems with uh, uh, herbicide resistance and weeds. And so I think our growers are really catching on to this to rotate those modes of action, which is good. Uh, crop rotation, I mentioned earlier on about uh, some of our acreage and needing to uh, um, uh, do a better job of rotation and accurate diagnosis for sure. Leads us back around to where we started. This is my second to last slide, so I'm gonna finish up. This was a disease I don't have a lot of familiarity with. This is Diplodia cholerot, caused by last Diplodia theobromae. Consultants called me last year and they were seeing this uh, right at the end of the season. So they're like, what do we spray or do we dig? So they went ahead and dug. I said, I don't know what it is, but dig. I couldn't get to them in time. They sent the samples off and it came back as a Diplodia cholerot. And so you'll see it more scattered. Um, these slate gray uh, stems here that uh, you can actually look and find the pygnidia, uh, which is a, a fruiting structure on it. Um, again, 
this is one of those where um, diagnosis is important because fungicides really don't work on diploidia. They don't work on it in corn, uh, so they really don't do a whole lot here either. It is associated with drought stress and tomato spotted wilt virus, so that's where it really picked up and took off for us. Uh, we had a thin stands at the beginning of the season. We had more tomato spotted wilt, and again, that's where we saw it picked up. With that, this is my last slide. Um, you know, again, really thank for the supporting agencies to help us, and of course, our local folks with the Birdsong and Delta. Um, and if time's permitting, um, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Okay, thanks, Travis. You certainly, again, uh, like our other speakers, have given us an awful lot to think of, think about. We see overlap there with our own situation. There are obvious, obvious and significant differences, but uh, a lot of similarity too. We appreciate the great work you're doing over there in the partnership. I think what we'll do in the interest of time, if you have a question for uh, Dr. Fasky, put it into the chat and Josh will see it and we can uh, get that to Travis. In the meantime, let's, uh, Josh, let's move on to our next speaker. Travis, we need you to... Uh, Am I still sharing my screen? You're no, good. you're good. You're okay. Good. All right. Okay. Thanks. All right. Okay. Our next speaker is, uh, next presenter is uh, Dr. Todd Bauman. Todd is Extension, uh, OSU Extension Weed Scientist, works out of Ardmore, Oklahoma, works on all the summer uh, row crops, and we appreciate the great work he does. And uh, Todd, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, Ron, thank you. I'm trying to get on the right screen here. Is that sharing now, it guys? Is. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, well, uh, glad to be here. I think like all the other speakers, obviously wish that, that we were meeting in person and, and look forward to as we move throughout the year and, and hopefully uh, uh, as we get to our field day time, we can all meet and, and go through the, the research that we're doing. Uh, with that being said, before I start, I would like to uh, definitely thank the uh, research station there at Fort Cobb for all the help that they do in helping us conduct the research um, and the support of the peanut growers and uh, Oklahoma Peanut Commission for their support of Oklahoma State and, and the research that, that we try to do to benefit you guys. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to uh, start with a little bit of a, of a different uh, approach here, if you'll, if you'll allow me, uh, and talk a little bit about the situation that we dealt with last year uh, with the Extend technology. And while that technology has been developed in soybeans and cotton, I think it's, it's cognizant for all of us that are involved in agriculture to kind of be aware of that situation and, and what it could potentially do to us, not only in those crops, uh, but potentially in other crops and, and the pesticides that, that we look to use to help us make a crop and, and be able to make a crop both economically and provide uh, food and fiber uh, to the U.S. citizens. With that being said, I think most of you are aware on June 30th, the Ninth Circuit Court out of California uh, vacated the label for the Ingenia, Fexapan, and Extendamac products, basically making those illegal to use in extend soybean and cotton. Uh, that date came after a large portion of those crops had already been planted. And of course, almost all of the seed had been purchased uh, prior to that ruling. Uh, I will say fortunately, to at least to some degree, uh, EPA did uh, grant us a little bit of a reprieve uh, by allowing producers and applicators to apply those products that were already in their possession uh, prior to that ruling and to make those applications through July 31st, 2020. So that was kind of where we're at. Uh, we do currently have a label for those products uh, with the exception of Fexapan and that wasn't an EPA decision, but Corteva decided not to pursue that product anymore. Uh, but we do have a label that runs through uh, December of 2025 for Agenia and Extendamax and also the prepackaged mix of Dual plus Extendamax, which is 
being marketed as Tavium from Syngenta. With that being said, uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about the Ninth Circuit Court, you can see this is essentially covers the area in tan. Uh, so these are the states that, that fall under the Ninth Circuit Court. Uh, but interestingly enough, with that ruling, uh, that allowed them basically to vacate that label across the United States and not just in that Ninth Circuit Court. Uh, for those of you that are or aren't familiar with the Ninth Circuit Court, this was the same court uh, that held up the registration, planning, and use of Roundup Ready Alfalfa when it was originally being developed. Uh, so this is a, is a court that has, ha has hampered us to some degree in the past as far as as agriculture production and, and being able to take advantage uh, of various technologies. To kind of give you an idea of why that, I think that's important, if we look at the soybean acres in the United States, uh, you can see that represented on this map. And essentially there are no soybeans that are grown in those states that are covered by the Ninth Circuit Court. Uh, when we move to cotton, uh, there are some acres that are grown in Arizona and also in California. But I think there's two points to make. If we look at the 10 to 15 million acres that are grown annually, uh, somewhere between less than 150 to 200,000 acres are grown in Arizona. Uh, last year, less than 100,000 of those acres were actually in the Extend technology and the Extend technology or the herbicides are not labeled in the state of California at all. Uh, so essentially we're looking that at less than 100,000 acres of cotton or soybeans uh, that were affected in that area that the Ninth District Court covers. Um, and why do I bring this up? I think this is uh, kind of to make the point that I think it's extremely important um, that we uh, are active with our organizations uh, and make them aware of some of these decisions that are made and how they potentially uh, hamper us going forward. Uh, you know, my biggest concern is, you know, is this just the first shot uh, of us to be able to effectively manage our crops going further? And with that being said, uh, I don't know how many of y'all are aware, uh, but the, the new label set basically a cutoff date for soybeans of June 30th and for cotton of July 31st that these products can go out over the top of these uh, extend cropping systems. Well, initially when that label came out uh, late quarter last year, uh, we were under the indication that we would be able to adjust that uh, a date within our state via a 24C label uh, because I think it's important that date is a federal label that basically runs from Minnesota to South Texas and from Washington to Florida. Uh, so it's, it's one date for the entire United States. Uh, kind of to give you an example, if you think about uh, cotton or soybeans in South Texas, basically these products can be used as a harvest aid in those systems potentially. Uh, but pro may not be able to be used in double crop soybeans in Oklahoma at all because of those federal cutoff dates. Uh, and again, all indications at this time are that we probably will not receive a 24C to extend those application dates uh, within our state. And I, as I mentioned, that will be quite disconcerting. Uh, will hamper us some degree in cotton and definitely will hurt us, especially in our double crop soybeans. Uh, so again, while, while these technologies are, are not developed in peanuts, uh, I think it's extremely important that we be concerned about this and, and where it could potentially affect us on down the road uh, in, in potentially new technologies that could move forward in, in peanuts, uh, making those either difficult or almost impossible to use depending on how those rules are set. And again, just encouraging you guys to, to be active with, with your individual organizations like the commission uh, to potentially help address those issues in the future. Okay, with that being said, we'll move into the, the weed control part and I'll step down off my soapbox uh, now. Um, 
I think you guys have seen this slide before, but I think it's extremely important, uh, especially when we're talking about weed control in peanuts, uh, to think about the overall system approach uh, when we're producing those and all of the factors that go into not only helping us develop an effective weed management program, uh, but also making sure that, that we do the best to produce the yields that we can uh, so that we can ultimately make a profit. Uh, with that being said, I like to say that basically you set your yield goal at the start of the year and then everything that you're doing from that point forward, whether it be irrigation, fertility, disease control, or weed control, is to help maintain that yield goal. Uh, we're not really trying to add to that yield goal as much as we're trying to make sure that we do all, our, all that we can to maintain that. And weed control definitely falls under that category. Uh, the choice of either not using a pre-emergence, uh, not using as effective pre-emergence up front, uh, missed timings with the post application, all of those uh, limit the ability that we have to maintain that yield goal that we set uh, early in the season. And each one of those mistakes, I would say basically lower um, our potential yield goal and we're setting that at as a different level as we move throughout the season. Uh, so again, doing things up front uh, to manage that is extremely important and then being timely uh, with all of our management applications. Again, whether that be irrigation, uh, a fungicide application or weed control are important uh, and probably the most important thing that we do as we move throughout the season. Uh, with that being said, I think it is important that we realize that not all of our control issues are resistance. Obviously, in the weed control realm, uh, weed resistance, you know, if you look at any farm magazine from a weed control standpoint, uh, probably outside of the dicamba topic is the number one uh, article that you will read. Uh, but I do think it's important that we realize that not all of those are resistance issues. Uh, there are tough weeds out there, such as nut sedge, uh, Russian thistle, uh, that may take a little bit different approach uh, than will work with some of our other weed problems. Um, and so recognizing those problems, realizing that those are problems that we have uh, that may require a different approach is extremely important when we're building our overall weed management strategy. Uh, the other thing I think is extremely important is to back our decisions with good scientific information. Uh, you know, we continually see products uh, that are pushed that uh, may either supposedly can we can lower our rates uh, or it can increase control, uh, increase control of some of these resistant weeds or troublesome weeds. Uh, and while some of those products can definitely be beneficial to us, I think the biggest thing is to make sure uh, that every dollar that we're putting into our weed control system that we're actually getting some value to that. Uh, it's extremely important that, that that information is not only provided, but that it's also scientifically sound. Uh, I like to tell the story about, I was involved in a fungicide trial in wheat uh, several years ago, and we had an individual location uh, that I never did get to to spray. And if you looked at the numerical yields based on an individual rep, there were situations that were showing, even though that fungicide didn't go out, that it was giving us a yield boost. But when you average that across the four replications of that trial, uh, we didn't see any difference, which is what you would expect since basically nothing went out there except uh, rainfall and mother nature. Uh, so again, making sure that that information provided to us uh, is scientifically sound and gives us realistic expectations is important uh, when we start thinking about you know, we may be better off spending a little bit more money on another residual herbicide or making sure that we use the proper rate uh, than expecting something else to help us out in that situation. Uh, with that being said, as we move forward, uh, making sure that we do a good job to control any of the uh, fall weeds that we have out there. Hopefully in a lot of cases, we've already made an application to control some of these, uh, but it's extremely important. Uh, that we have an effective fallow program. Uh, when we think about something like mare's tail, obviously a phenoxy herbicide can be beneficial there. Uh, if we're dealing with something like uh, 
Russian thistle or tumbleweed, an application of Paraquat in a lot of cases will be much more effective uh, than some of the other products that are out there. So building your fallow program and making sure that we have a good program out there because it's extremely important that we start clean to stay clean. Um, and if we look at any of the competition data that's been developed in peanuts throughout the years, uh, that first four to six weeks is critical, uh, not only from a peanut growth and development standpoint, but also from a yield standpoint. So doing what we can to start clean, to get that crop off to an early start, a uh, good start is extremely important. I think all of us remember last year and, and how slow things were to develop and we don't want uh, weed control to hamper that development any more than, than possible. The other big challenge I think for weed control is irrigation or an activating rainfall. Fortunately in Oklahoma, the majority if not all of our peanuts are produced under uh, irrigation uh, and making sure that we properly use that irrigation to activate those herbicides I think is extremely important. Uh, I know all of y'all have heard this speech before and I'll probably keep giving it till I retire. Uh, yellow herbicides are still extremely beneficial to us uh, and making sure that we activate those properly with that irrigation uh, is the best way to make those an effective tool. Uh, we still get uh, good activity on pigweed uh, with these materials and then for our guys that are dealing with any grass problems such as Texas panicum or crabgrass, uh, this is still one of the biggest tools that we have in our toolbox for managing uh, upfront both of those weeds. Uh, with that being said, uh, we do have some good pre-emergence herbicides. Uh, the dual outlook and warrant uh, can all be beneficial. And I would say for us in peanuts, uh, Valor has been an extremely valuable tool. Uh, in fact, I prefer to see it go out uh, pre-emergence, either alone or in combination with the yellow herbicide uh, and saving maybe our dual outlook or warrant for that uh, at crack or early post-treatment timing uh, to, to extend that residual as we move throughout the season. With that being said, while I think Valor has been an extremely important backbone to our weed management systems, uh, in northeastern Oklahoma we have seen some situation where it does look like we may be developing some resistance to Valor. Uh, this was in a lot of cases where we were growing Roundup Ready soybeans and essentially we're relying totally on those PPOs as our only mode of action that was controlling them. Uh, hopefully with peanuts we've either been in a rotation enough uh, or we've used other herbicide mode of actions to protect that Valor. Uh, but I would say if you've been relying heavily on Valor as kind of your only real mode of action for controlling weeds, you may want to watch this and I definitely would recommend uh, coming in with something else uh, either pre or post to protect that because I do think we would all agree if we were to lose Valor uh, as a potential option pre-emergence uh, that we, it would be detrimental to our overall weed control programs in peanuts. Uh, and this is where we've seen generally uh, much more overall control when we've used Prowl in combination with Valor. Uh, this has been kind of a backbone pr program for us. We use this on most of the station on our production peanuts uh, and in our variety trials. Uh, when we think of kind of an overall weed complex and at the station, of course, we've got pigweed, uh, Texas Panicum, Morning Glory, and also some nut sedge. Uh, we see a 15 to 20% increase in weed control when we combine those two products versus using either of them alone. In fact, probably even a little more control than say a yellow herbicide alone by using that additional Valor. So again, uh, we still see some real value to that product. Uh, the biggest thing is I think we just wanna make sure that we're doing what we can uh, to minimize the potential resistant development to the Valor herbicide. And what we do see with resistance with Valor is it's not a complete loss of the technology, uh, but say where we were maybe getting four to six weeks of residual control out of Valor, that's gonna be reduced to two or three. 
so you can still get some benefit out of it even where resistant develop, uh, but you're going to have to be a lot quicker and a lot more timely with those post applications uh, to get the full benefit where resistance does develop. Uh, we did receive a label for Zidua. Zidua. Uh, this is the pyroxysulfone product developed by BASF. Uh, for residual control, it's, uh, it's early post-emergence uh, is the application window for it, uh, but it only provides residual weed control similar to what we would see with dual or warrant. Uh, 1.5 to 2.1 pound uh, ounces on our coarse, coarse peanut soils and can go out as a split application at either at crap followed by an early post, uh, no more than three ounces per season. Uh, we have seen good activity with that split application. Uh, if I was gonna go with a single application, I think fitting into that at crack window is, is where it helps us the most. The other new product that we've recently got a label for regarding uh, peanut weed control and herbicides is Anthem Flex. Uh, this is being marketed by FMC. Uh, this is a premix of pyroxysulfone, which is the same, similar to the Zidua product, and it's prepackaged with carfentrazone or what you would be familiar with as AIM. Uh, so it actually has some post and residual pre-emergence activity. Uh, it is labeled early post-emergence, just like the Zidua product, so it doesn't have a pre-label. Uh, you can get some activity on some of the broadleaf weeds. It's not going to have any uh, post-activity on grasses and limited post-activity uh, on pigweeds. Uh, but if it's where you do have a problem, say, with morning glories, you will see some benefit to the AIM uh, in that pre-mix pre package. Uh, rates 2.7 to 4 fluid ounces uh, because it does have some post activity. It's recommended that you put it out with an adjuvant of some sort. Uh, and again, it can go out at crack to beginning of pod development. Again, this is a product where we've probably seen the, the biggest fit uh, in that at crack window. And I would say for maybe guys that are somewhat hesitant to using Gramoxone at crack, uh, this may be a product that would fit in that window as well. Uh, but again, it's not going to have the gra small grass activity or the pigweed activity that we would see from germoxone. Okay, as far as germoxone concerned, I would say this has still been a backbone uh, program for us there at the Fort Cobb station. Uh, similar to the Valor, this has been a product that we continually use uh, not only in our weed control plots, but also throughout the station. Uh, on our production areas. Uh, I would say, you know, as much as the Valor has, and, and the yellow herbicides have been a backbone, uh, this has been an integral part to our overall success. Uh, where we see it fit the best is where we use it in combination with one of the dual warrant uh, Zidua type products. Uh, and what that allows us to do is, is burn down any existing vegetation. Again, that note needs to go out early uh, when those weeds are small to get the bang from the germoxone, uh, but adding those residuals, essentially what we call layering a residual. And you follow that Valor residual right before it breaks or right after it breaks with, with those uh, dual warrant residuals to extend that residual either into the season or before we put out a post application. Uh, but I can't stress enough how important and how well that treatment has worked for us. Uh, we haven't seen, uh, well, you are gonna see some burn from germoxone as you would expect. Um, I just, I generally recommend not looking at them for seven to 14 days after the application uh, so that you're, you're not as concerned about the burn, but we can send you to see our high shields uh, where we use that in kind of a program approach to our overall weed control. With that being said, uh, if you haven't already completed your Paraquat training and you are planning on using Paraquat, uh, whether that be a burn down treatment or whether that be used at crack in peanuts or as a harvest aid in cotton, uh, EPA mandated that you must go, go through a training uh, to apply Paraquat. Uh, 
the one benefit to this is it is last for three years. So if you did do the training last year, uh, you're good for the next three years. Uh, you can go online to check that. Uh, and also it is an online training. Uh, you go through, you watch a short film, and then you answer a question. Uh, it does require you to make 100 on the test, but you can take it as many times as needed uh, till you pass it. Uh, but anybody uh, that's either mixing, loading, applying, or handling Paraquat, uh, so any of your workers that may be helping you in the mixing procedure, and definitely anybody that's applying it uh, is required to complete that training. Uh, we have developed a handout that you can get from your local county extension office uh, that will kind of walk you through the procedure uh, to do the training for Paraquat. But you want to make sure and, and get that completed uh, before we start the season if you haven't already. Uh, you guys have heard me say this uh, multiple times, but weed control, not only in peanuts, but any of the crops that we're dealing with is an integrated approach anymore. Uh, there's not really a, a one herbicide or one tool uh, that answers all of our problems. Uh, when you start thinking about the mix of potential weeds that we deal with, uh, the slow growing nature of peanuts, uh, you've got to, what I would say, start out strong and finish strong. Um, and it's extremely important, not only from that, uh, but also that we kind of use an integrated approach so that we don't uh, lose some of the valuable herbicide tools that we currently have available to us. I can't stress enough that it's important that you start clean. Uh, you need to use a residual. Uh, obviously where we have irrigation, we wanna make sure and activate those residuals. And, and use those to the benefits so we're not making our post applications too late. Uh, I think in all of these are gonna play into an, the part uh, to having an overall successful weed control program. Uh, finally, with that being said, uh, there are plenty of options out there where we can develop a program that will fit us. Uh, I think the biggest thing is don't make the solution bigger than the problem. Uh, planning ahead to develop those programs, I think are key to our success. Um, and again, using an integrated approach will, so that not only are we doing a good job this year, uh, but we're not creating problems for ourselves down the road. Uh, with that, I'd be ha happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, and again, I'd like to thank Josh and, and Ron for putting this together and the support of the growers and the commission uh, for the continued weed control research that we do to hopefully help you guys. All right, thank you. Ron, you're muted. I got it. <laughs> uh, you think you'd learn after a bit. Thanks very much, Todd. Once again, another presentation that's given us an awful lot to think about. A uh, bit different slant, but one that's really, really important. Um, I would just ask you if you have a question or a comment, put it into the chat and we'll get that to Josh either, I'm sorry, yeah, to Todd <laughs> either during this meeting or uh, later on. Okay, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Kelly Chamberlain. Uh, Dr. I'm Chamberlain. I'm trying to share my screen. There you go. The there right go. way. While you're doing that, let me give you the appropriate uh, update or uh, intro, I should say. Are you seeing my slides now? No, yeah. we're seeing your internet browser windows. <laughs> okay, let me try again. Now. Yeah. Great. Kelly, we have you at 20 minutes also. That was an old program that you were looking at. Okay, I thought I opened the one you sent out today or the this week, but no, it doesn't matter. I'm we're ready, good. but I just wanted to be sure. We're adaptable, you're adaptable, you're on now, no lunch break. So let me give you the introduction though, you just so richly deserve. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Kelly Chamberlain is no stranger to this group. Uh, Kelly is the research leader at the USDA ARS Wheat Peanut another field crops research unit in Stillwater. Kelly received her PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from OSU and joined ARS in 1997. 
She's the ARS peanut breeder for the Southwest US and focuses on development of improved high oleic peanut cultivars varieties with enhanced disease resistance and market quality. Her program focuses on three of the market types, runner, Spanish, and Virginias. And to date, she has released five varieties, three of which are currently widely grown in Oklahoma and Texas, and that would be Olay, Lariat, and Contenders. So Kelly, I'll turn the, turn the program over to you. Okay, well, thank you for the introduction. And of course, I share the sentiments of everybody else. I wish, I wish we could be in person and I'm crossing my fingers for next year. So um, you guys all know that the Oklahoma Variety Trials are, are, I conduct those trials every year. I've done that since Chad Godsey uh, left OSU. And um, each year we test breeding lines and currently grown varieties against each other in farmers fields and also at the uh, cattle research station at Fort Cobb. And, and we test runner Spanish and, and Virginia's in those trials. So this year we, um, we had our, held our trials at Weatherford out on Les Crawls Farms there at Fort Cobb and then a new location, um, Anthony Reed's Farms down in Love County. We had a lot of lines in our trials this year. Uh, we had a lot of breeding lines coming up through the, the pipeline that I wanted to see how they performed. So uh, we had 18 runner types, including three new runners uh, that Birdsong requested be put in to the trial. Those would be the ACI uh, cultivars there. We had six Spanish types, uh, and then we also had 19 Virgi uh, Virginia types, including some Virginia lines that I've been looking at um, that are from North Carolina and also a bunch of breeding lines from our own program. I'm not gonna go over the experimental design because it's the same as it always has been in the past, but there, uh, there are four replications of randomized block uh, design. So the Caddo County Renner trial this year, uh, the average yield for the runner test was 49.62 pounds per acre, and the average grade was 70, which is pretty good considering we had a pretty good year and a little bit of scare there at the end, but a pretty good year. Um, top yielders were ACI 1080 and Lariat, and breeding line uh, RSOC 93-1. And we did see statistical differences in yield and grade among all entries, but the grades were slightly lower, I think probably because we had a cool cooling off period there at the end of the growing season. Our Spanish trial at, at Fort Cobb uh, averaged 4,162 pounds per acre and 70% in grade. And there really weren't any statistical differences among the entries for yield but cultivar span 17 had the highest numerical yield at 44.39. And I would have expected that along with uh, AT9899 because those are small seeded runner type plants which tend to yield more. The Virginia trial at Fort Cobb, uh, the average yield was 4,519 pounds per acre with a average grade of 66. And we did see statistical differences among uh, all of the entries. Among the breeding lines tested, the NCEX17 was uh, the highest yielder. And I will say more about that breeding line later, but we are considering, we are going to release that line uh, with jointly with North Carolina State University. Contender was a, a top yielding cultivar at 5,604 pounds per acre. Moving on to the Custer County, Custer County trial up at, in Weatherford, the average yield for the runner test was 4,558 pounds per acre and the average grade was 68. And we did see statistical differences among the entries 
Lariat was the top uh, yielder averaging 5,358 pounds per acre. The Spanish trial in Weatherford, uh, we really didn't see any statistical differences between the yields there. But again, numerically, we see um, that the, the, uh, the small seeded runners were the highest uh, among the, the yield there. And um, uh, RSOC S88-2, which is a breeding line we've, we've been carrying along for several years, had the highest grade at 70%. I really like that line, um, probably won't carry it forward because in general, it doesn't outperform Olay. The Virginia trial in Weatherford uh, averaged 4,996 pounds per acre in a grade of 65. We did see slight differences no noted in the yield among the entries. And um, ACI 351 and breeding line in CEX 17 had the highest yields at 5,805 pounds per acre and 5,676 pounds per acre. Okay, this was our first year to conduct a trial in Love County. I was very pleased with the results. Not only was Anthony a great cooperator, but the yields were, were amazing. Um, we did see statistical differences in the runner trial and the average yield was 4,998 pounds per acre at 71% for the grade. Lariat um, was the top performing cultivar at 5,466 pounds per acre. And RSOC 47A was the breeding line that, that had the top yield at 5,777 pounds per acre. The Spanish trial at Love County, we did see statistical differences among um, the entries there as far as yield. The average yield was 4,304 pounds per acre and average grade was 70. 1898.99 was the highest yielder at 4,791 pounds per acre. For the Virginia trial in Love County, the average yield and grade um, were 4,869 pounds per acre and 63. The top yielder was one of our breeding lines at RSOC V101-1 at 56, 53 pounds per acre. So uh, every year I do a little, just, you know, average the yield and grade across locations. Uh, so this, this slide shows that analysis. And um, for the runner trials averaged across locations, Lariat, was the top yielding cultivar at 5287 pounds per acre. Across locations for the Spanish trials, um, uh, and we saw that, of course, the uh, 189899 and Span 17 were, were higher yielding than the traditional Spanish, and Olea was at 4,146 pounds per acre. Now, obviously the percent trial average on that slide is really, <laughs> is uh, reversed with the, the revenue slide. So I apologize for the revenue column should be where the uh, percent of trial average column is. My apologies there. Performance of the uh, Virginia market types across locations. Uh, we have the contender as the top yielding cultivar at 5,290 pounds per acre. And the NCEX 17 breeding line was the top yielding breeding line um, at 5,391. I also do a two-year average. Um, I'd like to do a three, but sometimes we switch entries uh, pretty quickly depending on the performance of the line. 
So usually I just have a two-year average that I can do for each location. And we don't have a two-year average for Love County since this was our first year to conduct a trial there. But for Caddo County at Fort Cobb, we see um, the two-year average for the runner trials in this slide. And Lariat was the, the top yielding cultivar at 4,781 pounds per acre and 72 for grade. For the Spanish and Virginia market types that are shown on this slide, uh, we didn't see any significant differences in the Spanish cultivars that were tested um, or for the Virginias. But for the Spanish, uh, we had Olay as the top yielder over two years time for at 4,008 pounds per acre and contender, no, not contender, uh, ACI 351 as the top yielding cultivar for the Virginias at 4,792 pounds per acre. Overall, the top entry for the Virginias was the NCEX 17 at 4,858 pounds per acre. So this slide just averages, this summarizes what I just said um, of the two year averages there for Caddo County. We were able to generate two year averages for Weatherford. We, we held our trial up there every year. So for Custer County, um, we had Lariat again as the top yielding runner at 4,548 pounds per acre and a grade of 71. For the Spanish and Virginias, we did see uh, significant differences between the, the yield and Spanish entries over two years time. And the average yield was 3,592 pounds per acre with a span 17 being the top yielding cultivar at 4,029 pounds per acre. And over the two year average in Weatherford for uh, the Virginias, we had a uh, contender as the top yielding cultivar at 4,750 pounds per acre. And NCX 17 was the top yielding breeding line at 4,530 pounds per acre. And this slide just summarizes what I just said about um, those two year averages. Uh, I averaged the, the data for the two year averages across locations. So from 19, 2019 and 2020, uh, over, over that period across locations, uh, the top running, the top runner cultivar was Lariat at 4,664 pounds per acre and a grade of 71. For the Spanish and Virginia market types, uh, I did see statistical differences in, in the Spanish there with Olay being the top yielding cultivar at 4,337 uh, 4, pounds per acre and a grade of 64. Um, for, the, for, for the Virginia types, the top yielding cultivar was contender at 4,689 pounds per acre, but it was followed very closely by ACI 351 at 4,654. And um, also followed closely by the breeding line NCEX 17 at 4,694 pounds per acre. This slide may be a little difficult for you to read and I just know it looks busy, but I wanted to show you that uh, we did pod size distribution analysis for all of the Virginia trials. Um, and, and, and we also did one for the UPPT test that was carried out at Fort Cobb. And I show this data because um, I wanted to let you know that the, one of the, re the main reason that we will be releasing uh, the NCEX 17 later this year is because it has a very high super jumbo 
percentage of pods, much higher than that of contender and, and other um, cultivars. So uh, it, is, it is in general over all locations, a very good performing um, breeding line. It's also early. The only the reason I started evaluating this line, these those uh, North Carolina state lines, was at the recommendation of Rodney Coe. He set up a, a project between Tom Islib, who's now retired, and myself, and we evaluated about a hundred different early potentially early maturing lines of Tom Islibs out here in Oklahoma, and that's been many years ago. Um, since that time, we we made selections within the breeding material that we were sent. And NCX, NCEX 17 is one of those resulting breeding lines that um, is about seven, week, seven days earlier than contender. So about, it's, it's, nice, it's nice and early compared to the cultivars that are grown now. Uh, Rodney thought that would be of interest to the growers in, in West Texas, but I think it's also in, re, in light of recent years here in Oklahoma would be beneficial. So this, this line will be released later this year. It's got a nice pot size distribution. It's got um, some tolerance to disease, but I would not comment on that yet because I'm gonna let Rebecca comment on that. Uh, it's not as high as we'd like, but we've only really been testing it for a few years as far as disease. However, it is an early maturing line that might benefit some of the growers in our state and in Texas. Uh, one thing I wanted to say is that I do put these, I do put my cultivars in the Texas state variety trials and I received the results back probably a few weeks ago on, on those. Um, some of, in some locations in Texas, our lines did very well. So in Central Texas in 2019, Lariat had an 8,478 pound yield. And in 2020, it had an 8,174 pound yield. And that would be in Comanche County in Central Texas. Olay did really well there too. In 2020, it had a 7,218 pound yield on a Spanish, which was hard to believe. And that must be the place. And, uh, and Contender also uh, in 2019, 7,530 pounds per acre. In 2020, 6,672 pounds per acre. Um, in the Rolling Plains in Collingsworth County in 2019, Larry had a 6,000 pound yield. And in uh, 2020 in South Texas, NCEX 17 had a 6,000 pound yield. So we're, we're, con we're constantly looking to see how these things perform outside of Oklahoma because uh, obviously ARS tries uh, to serve stakeholders in Oklahoma and Texas. So that was just a little tidbit that I received last week or week before. So in summary, um, I think that as usual, the performance of, of cultivars depends on the location, but the averages across locations in 2020 indicated that Lariat was the, the top runner, performing runner. Uh, significant differences among the Spanish entries indicated that LA had the top yield, but the small seeded runner types of uh, 1898, 1898, 99 and Span 17 or the leader in value per acre, mainly due on their yield and grade combined. And uh, we didn't see any significant differences in the Virginia entries across locations in years, but numerically contender and the breeding line in CAX 17 led in value per acre. Uh, the pot size distribution analysis that, that I showed you indicated that besides the NCEX 17, which we plan to release. Uh, we, we also have several breeding lines in our own program that are showing quite a lot of potential uh, for an increase in super jumbo pods. I'd like to acknowledge all of the support, of course, 
National uh, Peanut Board and, and Oklahoma Peanut Commission for the funding and the Ag Experiment Station at Fort Cobb for all of the help with the labor and, and getting these trials conducted in every location across the state. Um, I'd like to thank Lisa Myers, my technician, and of course, Angie Harding is, works with Rebecca and the guys down at the station at Fort Cobb for their support. Take any questions if we have any time, Ron. You had one about the earliness of NCEX 17, but I believe you answered it in some detail. So okay. I didn't see any others, but uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Chamberlain, put them quickly into the chat room or into the chat feature, we'd appreciate it. Thank you, Kelly. Great job, uh, a lot guys. has been, as it's been for everybody, every speaker, a lot to digest there. Thanks for the great work your team does. Uh, now we move to the last speaker for the expo. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Bennett is a research pathologist for the USDA ARS lab in Stillwater. She grew up on a US Army base in Korea and in Maryland where she obtained a BS in animal science from the University of Maryland. After a stint in the Peace Corps, she completed a PhD from Cornell University in 2005, and she's been working on peanuts since 2012, when she moved here from California, where she had worked on fusarium wilt on cotton. Uh, most of her research is on screening cultivated and some wild peanut germplasm for disease resistance. And she's gonna be sharing her results from the 2020 disease, disease trials of cultivars and advanced breeding lines. Rebecca? Thanks, can you hear me all right? Yep. All right, thank you. Okay, I'm trying to square, share my screen right now. Okay, can everybody see that all right? We can. Okay, good. All right, so um, this is sort of familiar to all of you. Um, I do the Disease, disease screening for mostly sclerotinia and pod rot, since those are um, two of our biggest problems in Oklahoma. John Damacone used to cover the leaf spot, but uh, um, I haven't picked that up yet. Um, just some background. The trial is conducted at the Caddo Research Station in Fort Cobb, and the fields are not managed for sclerotinia or pod rot, but they are managed for other diseases like leaf spot and southern blight. We inoculate the plots with a sclerotia of sclerotinia minor, um, usually when the weather starts uh, getting cool in the evening. So this year it was uh, late, late August, I think the last day of August. Um, in 2020, we planted the fields on May 18th. The temperatures were cooler than average on, um, in September and October, uh, but the disease really didn't come on until I'd say mid to late September. So I'd say there were moderate levels of sclerotinia. There was little pod rot in this field trial, but I'll show results from um, our pod rot nursery later. Um, Compared to the past four years, um, from 2017 and 2019, we had a lot of web blotch. And um, we don't talk about web blotch very much, but uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, this is what it looks like. It's pretty distinctive from leaf spot. It's got kind of like a webby uh, margin with usually kind of a whitish halo. But that did not appear, I saw a little bit of it, but it did not appear as much last year. Okay, for our runner evaluation, we had 12 entries and in parentheses is the number of years that we've been testing it. Lariat uh, is sort of our go-to cultivar to beat. And um, we've also been testing Tamron OL11 for seven years now. Flow Run 107 is our susceptible control. It's highly susceptible to sclerotinia. And we had one new uh, breeding line from I, I, the International Peanut Group down in Brownfield from Dylan Wan's program this year. And then we had eight uh, advanced breeding lines from Kelly's program. The plots were dug on November 3rd. That's uh, 170 days after planting. Um, this is a bit later than I think we had wanted to dig, 
But if you recall the last uh, week in August, we had that the about five days of sub-zero or sub freezing temperatures. Um, thankfully, it was blanketed with snow. So um, that helped protect the foliage. So we waited to dig after that. OK, getting into the results for the sclerotinia, um, we did see significant differences. Um, the susceptible control, the flow run 107, um, had 53.5%. Um, just it sounds high, but just remember that this is disease incidence, so it's not severity. So it's the it's the number or the percentage of the um, sections that we see in the plot that have um, sclerotinia. Um, we did have, I think this is the, sec the second time that the R96-8, um, it's a very resistant um, um, reading line, and that had the lowest sclerotinia at 6.7%. Um, for yield, Lariat came out at the top with uh, over 6,000 um, pounds per acre. And then um, the two lowest ones was one breeding line and the low run 107, as, you, as you'd expect. For grades, um, the grades ranged from 60, about 63% to uh, about 72. And um, unfortunately, that really resistant uh, breeding line also had the lowest grades. And I think this, if I recall, this trend um, was similar back last year. For the crop value, the lowest crop values were in the two varieties that had um, the lowest yield. And Lariat and 92 13 had the numerically the highest yields. The three year uh, averages or results um, for, from, let's see, from these entries that we've included. Um, overall, the, the um, sclerotinia blight has been around 70% in the, our susceptible control. And um, it, it's basically higher than everything else, which is kind of what we want. Um, it helps to maintain our inoculum and, um, um, helps us get significant results, at least in this case. Um, for the yield, Lariat and the 92-13 um, had higher, higher, significantly higher um, yield than the flow run 107. The one thing that I would like to point out is, um, let's see, in 2018, we had really high disease incidence of sclerotinia again. Um, but it didn't affect yield too much as it, you know, I think the, a similar story kind of happened uh, this past year as well. But if you recall 2019, we had um, that really hard freeze on October 22nd and it killed all the foliage. So we didn't, and there were also poor sclerotinia conditions um, coming up to that. So we have no sclerotinia data for that year um, and the yields were uh, considerably lower. Okay, moving on to the Spanish and Valencia trial. We've been um, evaluating some Valencia lines for uh, Naveen Pupala in uh, New Mexico State because the, their, their program is just so small and um, he, he needed some help evaluating his varieties. Um, these were dug on 131 days after planting on September 25th. And these are all the same entries that we had last year, two from Kelly's uh, breeding program, Ole Schubert, Span 17, that small seeded runner, and three Valencias. Um, as, you, as you would expect, we don't see a whole lot because these are harvested, harvested so early and just also because of the um, upright canopy. Uh, but uh, the most sclerotinia was on Span 17. Um, we took the rating right before we dug. For the yield, uh, the breeding line 96-5 actually did pretty well. And um, the Valencias always seem to, I mean, this is my second year uh, evaluating these, but they always yield lower than the Spanish. For the grades, uh, the 96-5 unfortunately had the lowest or the grade um, and the Span 17 and the S88-2 had the highest grades. Um, for the revenue, the 
the yield from the 96-5 made up for the grade and um, span 17 um, also had high crop value. Oh, the other thing I want to point out is um, I'm calculating everything based on the 475 per ton, uh, but the Valencia contracts were actually 750 per ton. But this way you can kind of see them like comparing apples to apples. Okay, the three-year average for the Spanish. Um, one thing I just want to point out, we have the same issue in 2019 that I mentioned before, and it, I can't remember exactly what happened, but we harvested uh, the plots really late. So the yields were uh, low and um, the grades I think kind of took a hit too. Um, but uh, there aren't any significant differences for yield over the, the past three years, but San, Span 17 has the highest uh, grade and Schubert had the lowest grade. Moving on to the Virginias, we've had, we had 14 entries this year. Uh, Jupiter, which is the one we've been trying to find a really good replacement for. Um, Venus, Contender, ACI 351, Walton, and um, IPG 4, 464, which were, we were trying for the first time. And, um, again, from Dylan Wan's program down in Brownfield. Um, we've been testing these NCEX breeding lines that Kelly was talking about previously for several years now. And I um, took the six, six best of them to include this year. We've, we've had some, we've had, we've had data for the past three years. Um, and then we also had two new uh, early maturing breeding lines from Jeff Dunn's program at NC State. Uh, again, these were dug on November 3rd, 170 days after planting, um, after the snow, um, the other thing is we did not see a whole lot of pod rot in this field. The sclerotinia blight um, taken in early October, uh, we did not see any significant differences. Um, I just wanted to highlight these just because NC17X, um, there's, we're sort of, as Kelly mentioned, we're thinking about releasing that. And, um, but it doesn't look like it has a whole lot of uh, resistance to sclerotinia. Um, IPG also appears fairly susceptible. For the yield contender, NC17 and Jupiter and NC1 did well. And um, this one from Jeff Dunn's program did not do so well. For the grade, everything was basically better than that uh, one from um, NC State, and for the crop value, Contender uh, had the highest crop value. Over the past three years, uh, we have have some, I'd say, decent amount of data for these NC uh, varieties, although only really two years with sclerotinia because of that, that bad year in 2019. Um, when you average them, we don't see a statistical difference in the um, in the susceptibility or resistance to sclerotinia. But as far as yield goes, NC17 has the highest yield um, and these other ones have lower than NC17. Um, here, so we've been doing the pod size distribution by weight for looks like three years now. And um, this is still kind of new to me, but um, what I'm learning is that these values seem to vary from year to year, as you can tell. But I think the trends seem to be fairly similar, at least consistent among the varieties over time. Um, I'm, it's, this is kind of a labor intensive thing. So I think part of this variability um, among years is because of our sample size, we maybe should be taking a bigger sample size. But what I wanted to highlight here is that uh, if you look at Jupiter, which is the cultivar that we're really trying to find a good replacement for, um, NC17X um, has that pod size distribution um, that's a little bit more like the, the Jupiter that I think maybe the shellers are wanting. 
Okay, moving on to pod rot in 2020, as I mentioned, the thuratinia plots didn't have a whole lot of pod rot, but uh, we have a field, it's, it's kind of small that I plant um, or I rotate with uh, highly susceptible um, uh, lines from the, the, the mini core collection. And we leave, them, we leave the pods actually in the ground in, um, in hopes of increasing the inoculum. <clears throat> so in 2020, the, I'm sorry, the inoculum was pretty high. Uh, we had a lot of pod rot among all the, the entries that we, we trialed. Um, and there wasn't a significant difference among them. Um, the disease across the field, as you'd expect for pod rot, was highly variable, and this probably contributed to the, um, the, the not being able to find a significant difference. But I just wanted to show uh, the past year's data as well, um, that uh, we've had some a little bit more success, but again, um, in, in finding a little bit more resistance or, or what may seem like it's more resistance. So this N17X um, uh, had less than Jupiter in 2019 um, in both the Sclerotinia and the pod rot nursery in 2019. But pod rot being the way it is, I would really like to see a lot more data before I could say that this, uh, this uh, cultivar or this this breeding line is resistant. So in summary, um, we had moderate to moderately high levels of sclerotinia, but it came kind of later in the season and it didn't really seem to affect our yields. The yields were pretty good, um, but the I think the gr grades were relatively low compared to what we've seen in the past. Uh, we had high levels of pod rot in the pod rot nursery, but we didn't see statistically significant differences. Um, for the runner trial, Lariat had the highest crop value, and for the Spanish, the breeding line 96-5 had um, high yield, but it had low grades. Um, for the Virginia's, Contender had the highest crop value, and um, for NC-17X, wasn't too far behind um, as far as the crop value and um, yield go, but it has the highest uh, Yield, yielding grade over the past three years, and um, it's got consistently high um, number of jump, super jumbo pods, but it does seem to be susceptible to sclerotinia. Oh, I, I forgot to mention one thing, just going back to here, there was the question about the early maturing, um, early maturity of NC17. And if you look in 2018, um, the plots were harvested 147 days, and it did really, it did actually the best out of the, of the, of, of the varieties in that trial. Okay, and I think that's it. Um, I want to thank Angie Harding, my technician, and Lisa Myers. We couldn't do the work without them. Um, Bobby, Harley, and Brennan at the Caddo Research Station, they're, they're just amazing to work with. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them, or you can send me an email. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. As Rebecca said, if you have a question, you could put it into the chat room, but if you had one, you probably have already done that, or you can email her. As uh, Dr. Chamberlain pointed out, uh, the results of all of these tests will be available um, in the Partners in Progress report that will be uh, put out by uh, OSU in partnership with, o uh, with the Peanut Commission and uh, Trying to get back to um, shared screen here. Okay. Um, a report, a full report will be made available to everyone through our website and through OSU and uh, various other methods. So uh, you will have an opportunity to see all of this research again and uh, to your benefit. Um, at this point, this uh, concludes the technical part of the uh, Oklahoma Peanut Expo 2021. Uh, we thank our speakers, uh, the presenters. We thank those of you who are on today, and we hope that you've uh, gained benefit from it. Uh, we certainly believe that you have. Um, 
you know how to contact us. And if you can't contact the exact person you want to, you can always contact the peanut commission and we can put you in contact with anyone else. Uh, the, the program actually indicates that there will be a pesticide applicator update delivered by Josh Bichong, and that is still going to take place. Some of you have stayed on today specifically for that part of the program. Uh, for the vast majority of those who have been on Expo today, this does conclude the program. Those who are interested in this last uh, piece, the applicator uh, update, you know who you are, and we certainly invite you to stay on with Josh. Other, other than that, uh, we thank you again for your participation, and this concludes Expo. Thank you, everyone. Good job, Ron. Thanks, Les. Thanks, everyone. All right, Ron, you see what I got? You bet. You're All good. All right. So looks like we still have a few people online. I just got people. some. Was that, Ron? You have a few people there, right? Yeah. I think we still got 15 or so. So yeah. I'll briefly go over some applicator updates, uh, mainly private applicators. We got some updates for y'all as well. But the biggest thing is um, Becoming a certified applicator did change a couple of years ago. ODAF no longer does in-person testing and the private applicators will no longer have paper testing or take-home exams available. ODAF did go with a third party called PSI Services uh, to administer those exams. They're gonna be all proctored closed book computer-based exams. So for the private applicator, that's never done one of these other exams, that's the biggest change is you're going to have to take an actual test with nothing in front of you. Uh, so there is going to be some studying involved past the test in the future. We'll get to some recertification at the end, but while I'm talking about certified pesticide applicators, that includes the private applicators, commercial, non-commercial, even service technicians. There is a current exemption uh, for the private applicators due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, we are still uh, having some paper exams distributed. So if you're not current on your private applicator, uh, if you still want to be a private applicator, you can go to one of our OSU extension offices and get that exam. Uh, it's still a paper, take home and mail it in uh, to become a private applicator. That's going to be done this year. Uh, we'll get back to the proctored computer-based exams through PSI uh, next year. So if you're not a licensed private applicator, and you really want to do the take home instead of an actual exam, uh, your time is ticking. Like I said, PSI exams is one going to be administering these exams to be a private applicator or any commercial certified applicator. Uh, you have to go through the website to create the account and register for exam and schedule the exam at your lo nearest location. They do have a direct line now. There was a 1-800 number before that went to all of their exams and PSI offers a lot of different exams from cosmetology to who knows what, but they do have one just for us as Oklahoma applicators. If you don't have access to internet or rather avoid the internet, you can do it all through that uh, toll-free number. There are starting to be more locations across the state. And if you are close to the border, there might be some that's outside of the state, but uh, we do have several locations through Oklahoma. Like I said, if you are out of state or close to the border, uh, there are some uh, out of state locations that might be closer than some of the in-state options that still offer the Oklahoma pest, pesticide applicator exams. And there's over 25 different exams. So if you are private, make sure you select the right one uh, for a private applicator. Uh, the private and service technicians do not have to take a core, but every other category, you do have to take and pass the core exam before you take the actual exam in that category. And so when you're scheduling those at those locations, make sure you, uh, if you don't think you have a good chance of passing, you might do those on separate days because if you don't pass the core, you won't be able to take that category exam and you will forfeit that fee. Talking about fees, the exam cost is only, uh, Payment available is credit card, no more checks or cash. Uh, most exams, including the core, is going to be $95. So if you are a commercial ag applicator, 
you have to pay $95 for the core and $95 for the ag plant exam. Like I said, service technicians and private applicators do not have to take the core. And the private applicator exam is actually cheaper than all the others, only at $65. And some of that's going to PSI to host those exams and others going to ODAFT and the licensing and all that as well. Uh, so it is more expensive than historically. Uh, a little bit more about the information. You can still get the study packets and stuff from o the OSU extension offices. All the exams are 50 questions. You have to make the 70% to pass. The exams for the computer base are timed. You only are allowed 75 minutes. And make sure you show up to the exam times on time. If you are late at those locations, you are going to forfeit that fee. Uh, so especially when you're setting up account, make sure you use a valid email. So if the location is closed for whatever reason, weather or COVID or anything else, uh, you make sure you know you don't have to test that day. You can reschedule or cancel those exams at no cost as long as you do it two days in advance. Uh, you can't bring anything into the exam. They provide you with everything you need. Uh, there are some tutorials and test questions. So if you're not, if you're not very computer literate, uh, they do make sure you know, understand how to use the system before they walk away uh, to take those exams. But after you do the exam, you're a certified applicator, but now you have to be a licensed applicator. For commercial and non-commercial, there's a, a process. You have to provide insurance, and it is an annual renewal for those licenses. Private applicators, most of us know you have to mail in that license form. Uh, any that's done the, the paper version before, know you mail in that uh, with your packet, your test, or your test answers and all that with your check. Uh, but that is available online or you can print it out and mail it to them. But that is for the whole length of the certification. So till 2023, you're good for licensee on a private. The commercial, non-commercial, you do have to do that every year. The Oklahoma Department of Ag did uh, redo their website. Uh, so it is a little bit harder to navigate for some that's not used to it. Uh, but this is a direct link. Uh, you can get to all those forms. OSU's website for their pesticide safety education program is just simply pested uh, at okstate.edu. And we have a lot of links on there to Oklahoma Department of Ag, Food and Forestry, all the what's needs to know. Uh, we have a lot of links on that website that's very handy for all of our producers. So the main thing that we're wanting to get across today is that private applicators can now acquire continuing education units or CEUs and not have to retest to recertify. So ODAF categories and CEUs, every category is going to expire on a set year, regardless of when you tested. Uh, so for ag plant and private applicators, doesn't matter when you took the test, everyone expires December 31st, 2023. And the other categories might be different years, but each category has its own year. When you're getting CEUs, you can only get the half amount in any one given year. Uh, you, so for the whole five-year cycle, you're going to have to at least attain CEUs in three of the five years. Uh, we'll get to that here in a second, but that's the reason why I'm talking about this today. If you do not want to retest at a proctored computer-based exam and you want to do the CEU route, you're going to have to start getting CEUs this year because you have to get CEUs in 21, 22, and 23. That'd be the three of the five years. If you did taste, test late, into the cycle, uh, the CEUs are prorated and they're based on when you actually became certified. Uh, another little rule is you cannot get any CEUs that you certify. Basically, they said if you pass the test that year, you're knowledgeable and you don't need any CEUs to the next year. So just to make that clear as mud for ag plant and private, I forgot to take private off that top line. When you're calculating how many CEUs you need, it's four CEUs per certified year. And so if you're in for the whole five cycles, that's going to be 20 CEUs needed for that whole duration. That doesn't mean you need four every year. That's just how you calculate the total amount needed, uh, which is 20. Other than there's an asterisk by that 16. Uh, that's because ODAF was a little slow on rolling out the CEUs for private applicators. Basically, you're not allowed to get any CEUs for, as a private applicator until the year 2020 last year and so if you were in for the whole cycle you took your test late 2018 like a lot of guys did basically you got a year off you only need 16 this go around 
future go rounds, future certification cycles, it will be 20, just like I plant. Uh, but for this cycle, you only need 16. Uh, there are a couple others like aerial applicators, seed treatments, actually seed treatments and fumigation expired last year. So if you are wanting to do that, uh, the new cycle expires 2025. Uh, and I put the max in any one year. So if looking at what year for the pro rate cycle uh, for private applicators, like I said, we couldn't get any in 2019 or uh, we had to start in 2020. That's why it's prorated at 16. But if you did certify in 19, you need 16 as well. And then it's four less every year after that. So some examples for ag plant and private. Uh, like I said, if you did certify in the fall of 18, like a lot of guys did, you'll need 20 over the five years, except for private. For this cycle, we only need 16. Uh, so you can't get any CEUs that year. So in 2019 to 2023, you'll have to get all those CEUs and you can't get any more than 10 in one year. So that's why you have to get some CEUs in three out of the five years, because if you only get 10 in one year, uh, you have to get the remainder six or 10 in the other two years. So if you didn't certify till 2022, for example, you only need four in that last year. So private applicator recertification, there's two options. You can either just simply retest, which is a $65 exam, and includes the license. You're at the factor and travel into one of those testing sites. It is a proctored, computer-based, uh, closed book exam. If that doesn't worry you, that might be the way to go. If you want to go the CEU route, there's still that $20 re-license fee where you'll send in that form either online or print it off and mail it back to them at the end of this cycle. You're going to need 16 to 20 hours of CEUs, uh, depending on when you certified. So that's going to be a commitment of time, and you're going to have to get that in multiple meetings. Like I said, you can't get that many all at once, and it's a long-term commitment. You're going to have to start at least this year and get CEUs and get CEUs next year and the year after uh, to go that CEU route. So if you're already going to a bunch of meetings and we're going to start offering more CEU options at our OSU extension meetings, this is going to be a way to go. Uh, but if you're not going to that many meetings and you don't want to, the headache and worry about how many CEUs you get, it uh, might be simpler just to pay the $65 and retest uh, at the end of 2023 when the new test comes out. You can check online to see how many CEUs you have, how many you need, what current certifications you have. If you have questions whether or not you retested, uh, this Kelly Solutions is the website Oklahoma Department of Ag uses. So kellysolutions.com slash OK slash applicators slash login, and you'll need your application license number. You don't have to create an account or anything, but just put in your applicator number in there, hit submit, and it'll tell you all this information. Uh, currently, private applicators can't use this because they are still in the transition phase to add it to it. But if you are a commercial applicator, you can definitely use it. And here before too long, private applicators will be able to check their CEUs on this website as well. New Paraquat. Uh, Dr. Bauman already mentioned this, but usparaquattraining.com for that three-year certification. Uh, this came into effect a couple years ago. Uh, if you are buying Paraquat in smaller containers, less than 120 gallons, or so most of our jugs, it is going to have that closed system container where you have to buy the adapter to put that into your sprayer. Uh, so that's just another a factor applicators need to take into account beforehand because uh, the only other way to open that container would be to cut the whole lid off. But uh, 120 gallons or less, so shuttles, totes, they're not going to be included in that, but you might have to get the adapter to get those jugs into your sprayer. We do have a fact sheet like Dr. Bauman mentioned, uh, 2795 for more information. And Bauman already mentioned uh, Canva, uh, so I'll go ahead and skip that. We do have a couple unwanted pesticide disposal events uh, coming up here shortly. These are funded by the Oklahoma Department of Ag, Food and Forestry. Basically, they get a little money from pesticide registrations. So some of that money goes to collecting these unwanted pesticides. The OSU Extension Service does help uh, conduct these and uh, with the drop-offs and everything. So the first one's coming up here pretty quick, April 1st at Purcell at the McLean County Fairgrounds, and then April 27th at Claremore. Uh, these are free events as long as you have less than 2,000 pounds of product. Uh, 
if you are a dealer and you're a knower, dealers are required to pre-register through the uh, OSU pesticide safety program, that pest ed.okstate.edu. Especially if you're bringing more than 2,000 pounds, uh, they can't accommodate. They just want to know how much you're bringing. Uh, but this is for pesticides only. More or less, no questions asked. If you have a jug with no label on it, you just want it out of your shed, uh, take it to them. Be household products, could be ag products, any pesticide, but we're not allowed to take any fertilizers, micronutrient jugs, or anything like that. Waste oil, uh, paints, or anything are not allowed. So with that, uh, open it back up to any questions. If not, I think we might be done for the day, Ron. Okay, thank you, Josh, great job. Uh, Les, do you have anything for the good of the cause? No, uh, uh, you know, handling those chemicals, that's it's becoming more and more uh, safety oriented and certainly we need to follow up on that education to do it correctly. Uh, uh, but uh, those CEUs, I mean, is there a cost involved in getting those continuing education credits? Like I said, most of our OSU extension programs are all free and we're going to be more diligent about offering those CEUs. There are a few online options. If you go to Department of Ag's website, they do have a list there of showing some of those options. Uh, but for the most part, they're free. They're just the time investment of going and attending for the most part. Yeah. The only thing I do is like fence line spraying and something like that. I don't have the current license. So I guess I'm probably out of compliance then. Uh, private applicators and any certified applicator is only needed for restricted use pesticides. So if it doesn't say restricted use on the jug, you're good to spray it. It's just general use. But usually when you're purchasing those restricted use pesticides, they won't let you buy it unless you have a license. Right. Uh, but we know some of that goes through the co-ops and elevators and farm stores uh, without being checked. But for the most part, you should know if it's restricted use. And if it is, you should be a, a certified applicator in some way. Okay, thank you. Good information. Okay, thanks everybody. Hope for a, a good year, a better year than 2020, and we'll see you on the turn road. Thank you. Good job, Ron.